provides knowledge and ideas. We encourage people to reach and fulfill their potentials by exposing them to global leaders, role models, mentors who have made positive impact in this generation. Deploying the social media platform to connect mentees to mentors, a person at a time, a day at a time, a habit at a time. We read a book a month and also have a webinar a month to address aching issues raised in the course of the month. We are poised to raise world-class leaders who will utilize their resources and abilities to effect the changes that the world desires. Below are our social media handles. Oh, fam, you are muted. Oh, thank you very much, Coach. Um, what I was saying is, um, on the Read NGR platform, it's been an amazing journey for everyone that had been um, on an engagement on the platform. And we've had several amazing success stories from people across the globe, the people that are joining from the first cohort, and this is the second cohort. It's, it's, it's really going towards um, the end of the year, and then it's going to be an amazing wrap. So today um, is going to be a journey of a fantastic eye-opening and a mind shift, something you've never experienced before. I can tell you that for a fact. One of the things I did is to just do a check on our speakers, and when I saw the content they put out there, you know, there's... Um, there's um, there's a limitation to the content you can put up. But what I'm trying to say is, if that can come out of them, imagine what they will be able to dish out if you have a one-on-one -on -one contact with them. And today we are so privileged, we are so honored to have them on board. There was a reason I played that song from the beginning. Love connects us on many bases and on many platforms. So there is no restrictions to what love can do. And one of the things basically that had pushed you to have survived even up to this moment is your ability to love, all right? So it's about time to bring in um, our coach right now, even as she say a word or two about our speaker. So coach, it's over to you. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, <laughs> depending from the part of the world you're joining from. And I'm super, super excited to be here. In the chat room, can I see your favorite emoji? We have our speakers in the house. Aha, Nathan, I see you. Paulette, Emmanuel, Iforma, Oladimeji, Nike, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Tonight is going to be a blast. And in one word, can you tell me your expectations from this webinar we're talking about building businesses, building brands? In Read NG, we believe in giving back to build the society. We believe in making the world a better place than we met it. We are the ancestors that they will be talking about tomorrow. So we have to leave this world a little bit better, even if we can't do much, brighten our corner. So can you tell me what your expectations from this meeting is this evening? The speakers are in the house. Oladimeji says loaded. So your expectation is loaded that you will be loaded. Okay, come on, let's hear it. Mind sheet from the norm. Okay, can I have three more responses? Then I'm going to read the profile of the speaker. Mind shifting truths. They are hearing you. Two more, two more. My expectation is huge. Okay, now. One more. You know the way we say it's now without expectations, you're going to go away with nothing. So it's important that you're expecting something. Things to stop and things to start doing to grow my business and ideas. So you can keep dropping it in the chat room. I'm sure the speakers are listening. As I said, today is very special for us. Aside from our summit, this is the time we're having the highest numbers 
of speakers, and we are highly honored to have them. I'm particularly privileged to be the one that is welcoming them. I have Mr. Ezekiel here. I call him Lip Simple. The first time I met him on the corridors of the internet, he didn't know that this young woman, I tried to think that I'm young, existed. And I was listening, I say, see wisdom. Like, Nigeria has potentials. And sir, I'm not flattering you, you know, I dropped that DF for you that the first time, you people that say you want your mind to shift, you, that mind is already shifting, trust me, is a very simple person. For him to be here will make you understand that it's very simple. Like I was super honored that he could honor this inv in invitation at a short notice, despite his very tight schedule. And not only, he's, he's just an amazing person. Don't. Don't let me talk too much. You know, normally we play profiles. This time I said, no, uh, uh, but no I will read the profile. There, there are profiles. I, I was like, no, I, this profile I must read. So Ezekiel Solese is a prolific author. Now they hear, insightful speaker and a serial entrepreneur. There are some of us that have done lots of businesses. You are in the right room now and a member of the prestigious Forbes Coaches Council. is the co-founder of Nature Gift, Nature Gift Product Limited, a company that makes natural soaps from purple, nature fill, papaya soap, co-founder of Smith's Animation Studios Limited, one of the top two animation companies in Nigeria, Unade here, so it's not only Disney World, and the CEO of Lip Sapel, an organization whose acronym means life, investing, money, and business made simple. Your life is about to be made simple this evening. Can I hear an amen in the audience? The company has a mission to provide simplified, technical, inspirational, and motivational information that would enable everyday people make deliberate improvements in their lives and businesses. His activities as a speaker and facilitator spans over varieties of industries. As a business strategy consultant, he has worked over 2,500 businesses and also with some of top companies in varying industries, helping some of them improve revenue from the multi-million naira mark to the billion naira a year revenue. I hope somebody's ears is opening. He's also worked as an executive business coach to a few headless entrepreneurs, many of whom he has worked with to exceed the 5 billion Naira revenue mark. He has spoken for and trained organizations such as the Commonwealth, First Bank Fifth Gear Consulting, Unity Bank PLC, Shell Nigeria, ECOWAS, the Presidency, Senior Special Assistant to the President, Public Affairs, Nigerian Telecommunication Satellite Limited, Jirasnech Comsat, Center for Peace and Security Africa, NNPC, the Lagos State Government, Small and Medium Enterprise Development Agency of Nigeria, SMIDAM, the Nigerian Youth Conversation, to name a few, that's just a few we are naming you, and consulted for Society for Family Health, one of the largest DFID department projects by United kingdom in the world. He's also the host of Lim Simple EDC, Enterprise Development Conference. He's, he was also a guest speaker at ECOWAS Secretariat in September 2010 in commemoration of the Nigeria at 50 program. Courses he has handled include change management, business communication, strategic planning, business strategy, team building, entrepreneurial thinking, human resource management, process reengineering, to mention a few. We are still naming a few. He is the author of the book, The Game of Money, which was adjudged by one of the national newspaper as being capable of making a rich man out of a poor employee who reads it, accepts the idea and practices them. He is also the author of The Entrepreneur with the Power to Change Our World. This book has been adjudged the simple start book on entrepreneurship ever written. Ladies and gentlemen, on this auspicious 
I hope people are not too intimidated yet. On this auspicious platform, hey, hey, with read energy in the chat room, can you give me a round of applause, standing ovation as we welcome Mr. Ezekiel Solesi. <laughs> sir, we are honored. You're welcome, sir. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, this profile is going to cause problem now. It's going to look as if. <laughs> can you hear me? Please, if you can hear me, just say yes or type yes or something so that I'm sure that you can hear me. Can you hear me? Okay, 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 great. Okay, great. thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so I've been given a topic, uh, new wealth, same economy, and I've been given 30 minutes. Now, first, I'm happy that it's just 30 minutes because I'm in the middle of planning. I, we have a strategic growth convention happening at the hotel on Monday and Tuesday. And, you know, we're planning for 150 people. We have 200 people registered already. Um, so I'm in the middle of planning. If I show you the next office, it's like all the stuff on the floor. But typically, my sessions are usually 10 hours. So I have this workshop that I do 10 hours. You know, I'm working with people 10 hours the whole day. So 10 minutes. You know, for me, I, you know, I, I will try my best to share a couple of things. But what I'm going to focus on sharing is on philosophies that can enable you generate wealth from this same economy. And I would start with what happened in 2020, right? So in 2020, for if you are, you know, for whatever reason, if you are alive, <laughs> if you're alive now, it means that you were alive in 2020. And in 2020, what then happened was that we had the pandemic. And I remember exactly where I was, you know, when you know, the first lockdown in Lagos happened. Uh, I, was, I had a project in, in, in Worry. So I had spoken on Saturday and I was going to have my next session on Wednesday. So it was about Monday that the lockdown was, you know, was announced. And you, know, and, you know, that period, one of the places you don't want to be is in the hotel because, you know, yeah, I mean, it felt like I might you know what was going to happen. It was so bad. I went downstairs to the to the reception to tell them to remove CNN from my list of channels and just put movies there, <laughs> you know? But what then happened was that all of us probably started to say this. Oh, don't worry if you if you were alive by the end of this year. You know, you won. You know, everything is okay. You know, don't pressure yourself. Just take it easy this year. And unfortunately, a lot of us bought that bullshit. Because a lot of us don't realize that there is more money made in chaos than even at time of, times of peace. And I remember that I picked up the phone, called my team and said, you know what, this is going to be the best day of our lives. And I called some of the clients that I work with, some of my corporate clients, and I said, you know what, this is going to be an amazing year. Let's get out there. I have clients that ended 2019 with 100 million naira revenue and ended 2020 with 3.6 billion naira revenue. I have clients that ended 2019 with maybe less than 100 million naira and ended 2020 with over a billion naira because they did not buy into that nonsense, right? So the first thing that I'm going to share with you is if you want to create new wealth from the same economy as we are, don't buy into the bullshit, right? But I'm going to share three things that I think you have to focus on Right, and once you do that, or four things actually, right? Once you do these things, it's going to change you. And then once you change, the ability to earn more money will be significantly improved. Now, before I share this, I'm going to share something about myself. Um, so in, in the personal development world, there are two types of philosophies. There is what you would call fancy philosophy. So what I call fancy philosophies and then there's what you would call practicable philosophy. Now, a fancy philosophy can work, right? But it's not practicable long-term because it does not align with the human experience, right? A practicable philosophy is something that aligns with human experience. So I'm gonna be sharing with, I'm gonna be sharing some philosophies that might go against some of the things that you've heard before, but I would argue my case properly and hope that at the end of today, you would be able to adopt some of these philosophies, right? So the number one rule I have found 
is if you want to have create new wealth or you want to create massive amount of wealth, the first thing you must do is raise your standards. If you heard me, I want you to write raise your standards in the comment section, in the, in the chat box. Raise your standards. Write it in all caps. Raise your standards. I'm going to explain that to you, but just start with raise your standards. Raise your standards. Raise your standards. Beautiful. Thank you, Janet. Thanks, Idowu. Thanks, uh, uh, Read Committee Manuel. Great. Thank you so much. Great. <clears throat> so here's the thing. The truth is this. I know that you've heard this before, but I'm about to say something that you might not agree with. The reality is that you would never really achieve your goals. No, you would. You would never really achieve your goals. You would never really achieve, you know, your dreams. You would never really achieve your dreams. Never. What you will achieve, what is guaranteed that you would achieve, is that you would achieve just a little bit above what you cannot tolerate. You would achieve just a little bit above what you cannot tolerate, right? And so what happens is that, now, if this might have happened to you before, as the same happened to you before, maybe you're somebody who you've always driven a car, you've had a car for a very long time, you, know, you always drive a car, and then at some point, your car got bad, significantly beyond repair, and you're broke, you don't have any money, and then you go back to taking the bus, right? But in two months, three months, in a very short time, somehow, somewhere, you figured it out, you got a car, right? Has it ever happened to you before? If it's ever happened to you before, that's exactly what it is. The human being is, we are, our strongest, you know, motivation is to stay consistent with how we define ourselves. I'll tell you a perfect story. So when I was in secondary school, I used to be the host of practice. And in my school, if you were in the hostel during assembly, you'd be expelled. It was a big deal. And of course, you know that, of course, students would always want to break the rules. And, and in my school, right, just for context, the boys' hostel was at the far end of the school, far end of the school. It was so much at the far end that it bothered the school. So if you sort of jump the fence of the boys' hostel, um, you would be out of school, right? And so they realized the nonsense that they did, so they made the fence really hard. So think about me, I'm like five, five, nine, or five, eight. And think about how short I would have been in secondary school. And think about the fact that this guy I'm about to tell you about is one of the shortest guys in school. Now, he comes to me to ask me a question, not because I'm the host of the Fed, but probably because at the time, and I still am, you know, a practicing Christian. So he wanted to sort of find something. So he comes to me and he says, Ezekiel, I was in the hostel during assembly. I said, okay. He said, uh, and then Mr. Amosu came for a raid. I mean, of course, here went to body school. Went to body school, say hi. Right. So Mr. Amosu came for a raid, and if you went to school, you know that there's this raid, you know, this you know, coordinated effort where teachers just come and you know, try and you know, catch you doing something wrong. So he said, as the teachers came for a raid and they were trying to chase them, everybody sort of started running out of skelter. And unfortunately, he says, I, I was running towards the wall. He said that all that he was thinking about, this guy was in SST, he said all that he was thinking about was that how was he going to face his father, who was in the army, by the way, and explain to his dad that, he's, that he was expelled, you know, like for not being in school during the assembly, uh, during, not being on the assembly ground during the assembly, or being the hostel during the assembly. He said his father would understand if he fought somebody, you know, busted somebody's jaw, you know, something really violent. So he said that's all he was thinking about. And he knew that he couldn't face his father. And then he said something to me that was quite, you know, intriguing. He said, Ezekiel, as I was working, I was running, Mr. Amosu, you know, sort of zeroed in on him because, of course, he was the stupid guy who was running towards the wall. How many of us have that teacher from secondary school that was sent from hell? Everybody has it. If you went to boarding school or went to secondary school, you have that kind of teacher. So he said, as the guy was chasing him and he realized that the guy was behind him, he said he kept running and he said, Ezekiel, the fence was in front of me and then the fence was behind me. I do not have a memory of what happened between when the fence was in front of me and when the fence was behind me. In fact, what he then asked me afterwards was that, is it, you know, then we talk say for Bible, your Jesus Christ when they walk through walls. Is it possible that I walk through the wall? That's what he asked me. And of course, at the time, I'd read enough books to help me realize. I said, look, anytime something challenges us or challenges our ability for survival, we raise our standard because we have to stay alive. But the problem 
is that all of us do not do that in real life, right? So I'm going to share with you how to do that. Number one, you want to raise your standards. Number one, you have to set goals, right? Set goals. Don't just be somebody that leaves like whatever it is, but set goals. Set a goal of goals in love. So what I want you to do right now is to pick up your, in your notepad and I want you to write something, a goal. And since we're talking about business, I want you to write a number. You know, how much money do you want to make over the next one year? One year from now, how much money do you want to have in your account? Once you've done that, I want you to say yes or type yes so that I know that you've done that. If you've done that, I want you to type yes. Write down your goal and type yes. Great. Thank you, Kike. Kike. Is it Kike or Kiki? Victoria, FJ, Emmanuel. Great. Great. It's a nice class. So, <clears throat> so you write down your goals, right? But that it doesn't stop there. Writing a goal does not make it a standard. A standard is only a standard when there is something at stake if you don't get it. So the second thing that you need to do is to develop something called a vision board. I know a lot of us have heard about vision board, but it's really just a picture of something that you have or something that you want, you know, um, that is, you know, put somewhere that you can see it, right? I developed my first vision board. I, 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 I found out about a guy called John Asher. John Asher is a brain scientist. So he talked about vision board in 2008. And I said, figured it out. And in 2009, I got my first vision board. I wasn't married at the time. I was dating the person that I got married. So we put pictures of how much money we wanted in any kind of car wanted to drive, the kind of house we wanted to live in. The, the fact that, of course, the Smith Animation students were talking about uh, that we were going to start it out and we we're going to get 10 million in grants as a result of that. And, you know, uh, this was way beyond you being, you being at this time. And so we wrote it out, I you know, put it in the desk of my system, put it, you know, uh, she had printed it and put it in the in the in her room, right? And of course, after about a year and misplaced that stuff, my system had crashed. I'd even forgotten about it. In fact, it was four years, six years later, I read a book by Jordan Adler that explained that if you take a picture and put it in front of you for a year, you thought about it every single day. And even if you lost it after a year, your mind has gone to the proof and you get you there, whether you like it or not. So about two and a half years later, we're getting married, and it's two weeks to the wedding, and we go to her room just to move things from her room to her new place. And I'm shocked. I'm driving the exact, the exact same kind of car. Um, um, I'm earning the exact same kind of amount. We've, made te we've gotten 10 million in, in grand from the union. Everything was accurate. In fact, it was so accurate, down to the color of the living room and the color of the tiles of the place that we actually got. Which we got just a couple of months before that particular you know, wedding. It was stunning. I was like, wow. And that's how I changed my life. Every time I want something, I put it in front of me. I talk to my kids about it. I talk to people about it. And then I get out there. But I wanted to see if this was actually scientific, right? Because again, every time I get a miracle, every time I see a miracle, for example, I like to look at the science. I mean, I believe that God is not a magician. You know, so a lot of Christians, when I read the Bible, for example, but for those of us that are Christians, I read it to find the process, not just the miracle. So, for example, when the Bible says, oh, I mean, Isaac wanted to chapa and said, no, stay in the land, and he stayed in the land, and the same, same year he did hundredfold. People are like, no, if you stay in the land, you get hundredfold. That's bullshit. Isaac didn't get a hundredfold because he stayed in the land. Isaac got a hundredfold because he figured out irrigation. If you read the Bible, Isaac always meditated. And so what happens is that he sits down in that place and he's thinking one day, look, rain falls. Because the reason why there was famine, the reason why there was famine was because there was no rain. Rain falls, when this rain comes all the way from the sky, where does it go to? Because the Bible actually records that Isaac meditates every evening. In fact, that's the basis. I take a walk every evening, 8.30 to 9.30. I don't take my phone, I don't take anything. It's just time for me to think. It's the reason why I have to live in a gated environment all the time, because my wife needs to be sure that I'm safe but I take a walk all the time, every single evening. So Isaac is thinking, and he's like, okay, if rain falls from the sky and falls into the ground and doesn't go back, that, that means that if you keep digging, at some point you find the water. And so the Bible talks about the fact that he tried five times, five times, the fifth time he hit a gosha. And while everybody else in the country was having a farming situation, Isaac could water his plants, and so he got a hundredfold. That's how he got a hundredfold. He didn't get a hundred focus and sat down. Because something like, like, if you sit down and God, the bullshit, God provides every time a miracle happens, find the process. There's a process by which it happened. So I haven't said that. So I wanted to find that process. So I said to myself, 2015 December, I said, you know what? 
I want to go to Dubai. I've been to a couple of countries, never been to Dubai. So I said, I want to go to Dubai, but I don't want to pay for it, right? So I told my wife, and in our usual fashion, we put it on our vision board. And I said, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to work as hard. I'm going to, you know, over the next one year. Good. So I decided to go. For the whole of 2016, nobody calls me to go to Dubai. But December 15, 2017, I get a call from a client. The client calls me and I say, you know, I've been working with their sales team. I'm working with sales my client company. I said, you know what? I, you know, I like what you're doing for us. We did about five billion there last year. You know, I said, no, thank you. Pray, you paid for it. I said, no, no, that's not what I'm calling. I'm calling because I want to take my sales team to a retreat in Dubai in April. And I want them to find out if you'd like to go with us and train us there. You know, but even if it's something I wanted, I'm not just going to say like, you know, sharp, sharp. No, 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 no. I check my calendar, you know, look through it and be sure whether it can work with my calendar, you know, that kind of thing. And I said, you know what, usually when I go for all those trips, I usually like to go with my family. My family sort of that, don't worry, you know. And that's how I got the trip. And so from then till tomorrow, in fact, I live in a, the house I live in right now was on my vision board, every single thing. And why is that important? This is why it's important. There's something in our brain called the reticular activation system. Your mind, it's a lot more about recognizing than it is about actually anything else. How many of us have noticed that you want a particular car? Maybe Ring River Evo Black. And as you start to become obsessed about this car, it suddenly happens that almost everywhere you see the car, it's like the association of Range Rover owners decide that's in front of your house, that they want to come and start passing. But like, where am I seeing it every time? You're not seeing it every time. You're noticing it. You're noticing it all over the places. It's the same reason. How many of you have noticed that when you got a major race, you know, maybe you're one of those people who the supermarket, this complex, and uh, NASCO complex used to buy. All of a sudden, two million and knock your pocket. You now enter, you don't look at it, you see Kellogg's. Like, ah, Kellogg, did you guys just start putting Kellogg's here? You say, no, it's always been around. I say, hey, I've never seen it before. You know, and it's so affordable. Let me tell you what, what is happening. <laughs> because you were broke, your brain didn't allow you to say anything. <laughs> but now money have entered, you can see things, right? But here's the key. Once you determine exactly what you want, what happens is that you start to see all the opportunities together. Let me give you an instance. A lot of people have said that the last four years has been terrible, you know? And please, if you're in that category, don't say it. You see, because in the last four years, I personally know 26 businesses that crossed the five billion naira mark. In the last four years, now, as we speak today, Nigeria is the number one country in the world to build a technology startup. It takes two years, six months, 26 days to build a tech unicorn in Nigeria. It takes six years in, in, uh, in China, 10 years in the US, 30 years in South Africa to build a tech unicorn. Nigeria is the number one, tech number one company in the world to build a tech unicorn. Nigeria is the second largest cryptocurrency country in the, country in the world. In the midst of all this madness, right? You, you find what you focus on. I was talking to somebody today, the guy was like, ah, this election, this election, you have to get it. We cannot afford not to get it. I said, that's nonsense. I said, because if you think like that, I said, I had to kind of say, don't stop thinking like that. He said, why? I said, because it doesn't matter what the economy is saying. It's what you want to see. Because if you say to yourself that we can afford to get it wrong and the candidate that you want does not enter, you would immediately turn down all your expectations for the next four years instead of turning it up. And so you would focus on small opportunities. Some people will kick up their jackpot plan and go and wash toilet in the UK. That's okay if you want to do whatever you want to do. But the point is this. Number one, raise your standards. And I've told you how to raise your standards. Set a goal, put a vision board in front of you and talk to people about it. Why? Because it is more powerful this is the reality. None of us here, none of us here, including myself, none of us here, including God, <laughs> none of us here is as committed to our dreams as we are to our reputation. None of us in this room. Including God. Because you hear God say something. He said, I, have, I elevate my word more than my name. What does that sound like? Because your word, what you say, and being consistent with what you say is your reputation. So when you come out and tell people, I'm going to be successful, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do this, and people are like, uh, what's watching? What happens is that because
course, you don't want to come back and explain to them why you didn't do it. Guess what happened? You succeed. You succeed. It's the same thing that happened with Joseph. Now, thank God, I don't even have time. I won't be able to cover myself. Now, here's the thing. <clears throat> I read the Bible pretty much as a business document. It's a very powerful book, you know, and, and I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian for maybe 20 plus years of my life. Many practicing Christian. But I, I submit to you, submit to you, that Joseph, this, the, the, the most powerful strategy that Joseph had was that he told his brothers. In fact, I submit to you that the dream that Joseph supposedly had was not like he dreamt it in night. It wasn't like God showed him. He conjured that dream in his mind. You know why? Because just look at the situations. This man is the last born of a wife that everybody else does not really like. And all the big other brothers don't like him. They hate him. They maltreat him. They treat him anyhow. Isn't it quite convenient that he then has a dream that all of them would be servants? And then he tells them, then they're angry. Then they tell their dad. Then the dad is sort of like, why would you say that kind of thing? Isn't it also quite convenient that after his father rebukes him, he had another dream, and now his father is added into the people that are submitted to him? Isn't that quite? Doesn't that sound like something that somebody sat down and thought about and said, you know what, all this people, all this people, frustrate me. No worry. I go blue. I go scatter all of them. When money enter, I go show them. That's exactly the kind of dream it was. It wasn't like just slept and then in general, Nathaniel came and then just security came and said, Yeah, hey, no worry. You know, they are in goats, then you they will grow up, you will go down. No, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it was, and he told them, and because he told them, I believe that that telling them, because he doesn't want to come back and explain to them. You know the reason why I know that that words that he spoke to them haunted him? Because when he, when he became successful, when they showed up, he forgave them, but he showed them the extent of his power. He showed them. He hid something there. He showed, he showed them so much that when they realized who he was, they said to themselves, I'm dead. We're dead. Right? So having said that, one, raise your standards. Two, focus on your standards. See? I do not pay attention to anything that doesn't make me money, that doesn't make me laugh, that doesn't make me smile, and that doesn't help me grow in my Christian faith. I have no focus on it. You know, I tell people, if it's bad enough, we'll all hear it. So I don't watch the news. I don't. Why? Because where focus goes, energy flows. A lot of us say we want to be successful, but we spend a lot of our time reading information about people that are failing. In this same Nigeria, see, guy, in this same Nigeria, in this same Nigeria, I have a client moved from 100 to 3.6 billion to 17 billion to 20 something billion now, and now invested in tons of companies. Right now, as I'm talking to you, I'm consulting with them, and we're setting up five different businesses, each of them multi billion dollar businesses. But all of them are just did. They say things don't hurt, things don't hurt. It's not hard, it's you that it's hard for. And it's hard for you because you're focused on that. I'm telling you, I used to live in the country. I've sold in the Anoba market before. So don't be telling me all these things. I've suffered. So far, I've suffered. So so Even me and so far, we know each other. We are very close bodies before. You understand? So far. So, so far cannot even intimidate me anymore. It's so far. So but I realized, but while I was suffering those suffering, I said to myself, you know what? If I don't, if I don't have what I already want, if I don't have it, it can't get worse than this. Why don't I just want what I really want? Right? Why don't you just want what I really want? Focus on your, I would have elaborated it, but I can't do so much uh, because I have a session where I teach people in this area of focus on, on your standards, how to reorganize. I teach people how to rewrite their past. You see, because your past is not what happened to you. Your past is what you think happened to you. And sometimes when you have, when we add more perspective to that past, what you think happened to you might become different. So sometimes you don't need to heal from a past pain. You just need to rewrite that story. Because every time that something happens, it happens for us, not to us, right? The third thing as I run, because I know that I have just a little time. How much time do I have there? Is three, is take massive action. A lot of us here don't have bad ideas. You're gonna get beautiful ideas. Take my slow and steady is a scam. It doesn't, it doesn't win the race. What wins is fast and paced. 
fast and pace. What does that mean? Slow and steady, you know that tortoise and the dare thing. See, the only reason why the tortoise won is because the dare was stupid. <laughs> fast and pace. And the analogy is this if you take a, a plane, right? Plane has four engines. It takes all four engines focused. If you're in a plane, right? If it's taking up or it's landing, you notice that they turn off all the other things that are not necessary. You know, all the additional lights and all that. Why? Because the plane needs all its energy to push through gravity. Right? The plane needs all the energy to push through gravity. Right? And then when it gets up there, it can it can sort of glide. In fact, many times when the plane is, you know, seven something thousand feet, the pilot's chilling because it's autopilot, you know, it's on autopilot. The pilot is eating, the pilot's probably even partying. You don't know because if you see what the pilot is doing. Most of us will be able to sleep. But the point here is that at that time, it's safe. It's the reason why most plane crashes happen at just a little bit after takeoff or just a little bit before landing, because those are the two critical times. And so I tell people, you're a business person, you must have four times in your year when you're giving it full thrust. You, I mean, like we die here, kind of, kind of giving it, right? You have to just get out there, push through, and build massively. And the last thing I'm going to share with you is if somebody asks me what's the most powerful, most powerful key to success, it's not dreams, in my opinion, my friend, it's not dreams, it's not all of that. It is association. You must upgrade your association. You must be mindful about your association. You must be, you know, and the reason is this, you know, people tell you stand out, you know, be different. Listen, it's a fancy philosophy, but it's not a sustainable one. Because it is against the disposition of human beings. Human beings are created for inclusivity. That's why we define every way we define ourselves by race, by gender, by culture is inclusive. So I tell people it's not about standing out, it's about changing who you're standing with. See, because if all of us are inside this room, and only you are standing outside, after a while you come inside, right? And so what happens is that is that if you get into an association, what happens is that if you are ambitious and you have an association of people that are not ambitious, to fit in, because human beings have to fit in. To fit in, we would lower our ambitions to fit into the group. If you take somebody with no ambition whatsoever, put them inside a room of people that are really successful, what happens to fit in, that person would develop a dream, would develop a goal, would develop, you know, would get out there and want to be successful, right? And so I tell people that, see, if you want to be successful, you need somebody in your life that you're either too, too afraid or too ashamed to disappoint. Find that person and be successful. And that person cannot be your wife because the most important thing that that person must do is that if you're too afraid or too ashamed to disappoint the person, then the person has, needs to have one more quality. The person must have an inability to accept your stupid excuses. Because your wife will love you as you are. You know, that's what, that's what the teacher in touch, you know, love him as he is. But the point here is this. But the key here is, and what I do not teach is that you can't still association with people. People like, hey, you know, you're not really useful in my life. You know, they told, I went to a seminar, they said I was changing my association, so you're not really useful in my life. I'm not talking to you anymore. You cut them off. Don't cut people off. <laughs> because if you cut them and you cut them off, that's your cutting off can become, can make them very, very angry. And they will not going to become somebody. Two weeks later, two years later, 20 years later, you're in a boardroom. Is that person that's supposed to approve your letter? You say, hey, actually, so now, are you still cutting me off? No. What I tell people is this. Every six months in your life, people move out of your life and people move into your life. Just check it. Every six months, check your frequently called list is different. Slightly different. One or two persons move out, one or two persons move in. If somebody moves out, don't pursue them. But be deliberate about who's moving in. Go to the right places, have the right experiences, get the right people in. Now, that way, it allows you to cultivate relationships that are moving you forward. But it also allows you to reconnect with somebody from your past if that person becomes relevant. Because you didn't fight with the person, the person didn't fight with you, nothing happened, just reconnected, right? Very, very important. But the last key I want to share is that these people that you want to reconnect with, they don't want you in their lives. That one doesn't need, doesn't want you in his life right now. So you have to develop capacity to be very useful to them. Massively useful. Because people say, eh, I don't want to 
uh, as people that are not used to my life. That's nonsense. Your focus should not be losing association with people that are not used to in their life, your life. Your focus should be becoming useful to the people that you want to associate with. Right? So I hope, because I'm trying not to overshoot my time. I think I've overshot my time by three minutes. Um, I hope that by these words of mine, that you can look at this economy, see this Nigeria. Let me end with this thought. Nigeria, and if you've not watched this, go and look for this um, documentary. It's called The Men Who Built America. It's the story of five guys who literally built the entire industrial age uh, and essentially built the US. Nigeria is at a point that the US was in 1866. And the next 50 years is very critical for us as a country. And unfortunately, we're looking for that solution politically, but we can't get that solution politically. That solution is gonna come by enterprise and politics is gonna come much later to curb the excesses of that solution, right? So if you are a business person in this room, the next couple of months, the next couple of days, the next couple of weeks, trust me, is going to be stupendously, stupendously, stupendously filled with opportunities for you, right? Thank you so much. I see somebody that I recognize here, Docas. I hope she's the one, because it looks like her. But thank you so much, everyone. The one, Ezekiel. <laughs> right? So thank you so much for your time. I'm really, really grateful for the opportunity. I don't know if there's opportunity for questions. Is there, is there an opportunity for questions? Wow, thank you so, so, so much, sir. So much, <laughs> mind blowing. Can we have um, the expressions of what we've gotten from this short webinar? Um, from our very own amazing and awesome speaker. Let's have your reaction in the chat room right now. Yes, yes, yes. Wow. So we'll have, um, we'll have a session where we'll take um, questions. And of course, because of our time, we'll just, um, what, what we want to do is to put all the questions together and then direct them to um, each of the speakers that the question is being directed to. Thank you so, so much. This is just in fact, this is more than a pep talk. This is a this is a volume of great talk. Sorry that... to cut in offense. Ezekiel will not be able to stay for the round table, and he has said that from the beginning. Oh, so sorry. we yeah. can only have two questions so that it can go. If you have two questions in the chat room, specifically for Ezekiel, because it won't be around for the chat for the round table panel session. So and Ezekiel, that was beyond amazing. Thank you so much, sir. I'll be discussing you with you much. after this. That was in the chat room very fast. Anybody with a question, I'll take, I'll take two questions. Okay, what's your advice for a core member who has multiple business ideas and don't really know how to start up properly? Do you advise going fully into business or taking up a job? Well, I never took a job, so it's possible. And but yes, but I had one beautiful advice. Beautiful advice, you know. And in fact, the advice was so good, I married the person that gave me the advice. Too. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> so I used to have like a lot of you know ideas, you know. You know, and I, I did it personally, the person I got married to, I you know, started dating in the university. Yeah, Docas knows the lady. Um, so one day she sat me down and said, you know what, all of these ideas are great, but I need you to give me, I, need, I, 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 I don't want to chase you around alongside it. I need you to pick one of them. And I want you to be the one that can be, you know, that can be the most profitable quickly. And then I want you to give that thing five years. And in those five years, we won't talk about anything else aside from this. And when you achieve some level of success, then we can talk about anything else. Uh, and that advice changed my life. You see, because a lot of people who have multi-talented and all that kind of stuff, so there's two school of thought. Somebody says, oh, you can do everything. That's nonsense. Oh, you can't do everything. That's nonsense either. The reality is that you need to pick one of them and be successful at it. When you become successful at that thing, you learn some valuable lessons about leadership, about you know, business, about strategy, about delegation and all that. 
then you take that model and apply it to everything else. Richard Branson has more than 376 businesses, you know, you know, but he's, he started a magazine at some point, built it. Dan Wote has multiple businesses like we all know. Uh, Tony in the middle has multiple businesses like we all know. But we can all point to that one thing that he gave maybe five, 10, 20 years to. For Tony was the banking industry, right? It's rising at the top of the bank. For Dan Wote was his cement. You know, or it was, in fact, Dango was not his cement. It was his trading business that he did for the first 20 years of his life. You know, for a Tedola, it was the diesel thing that he figured out and eventually figured out everything else. You know, so, and if you're a core member, trust me, this is the best. I mean, tell you, you're a core member, I'm assuming you're either just starting, if you're just starting, you have one, you have two years, you know, so, and this is what I told myself when I was going, you know, when I was in university, I was going to find out, when I was going for my youth service, I said, you know what, it takes two years for you to find a job. That's what I told my wife. I said, it takes two years, when we're leaving school, I said, it takes two years, your parents are going to pressure you to want to get a job, but both of us didn't get any job, started our businesses. I said, your parents are going to pressure you to get a job, you know, it takes two years to find a decent job, but it also takes two years to get your business to a point where it looks promising. So don't be bothered about your parents. They want you to attend an interview, attend it, but you work on your grind. In two years, at the time when you are supposedly getting the kind of job that you think you your work, your business, at the time where my wife was going to get an opportunity, you know, because her mom was working in Guinness at the time, you know, it's going to get an opportunity for like a one year, 150,000 naira job back then. She had just executed a one million naira project, you know? And so her mom was like, uh, standing her younger sister, why don't you be like your other sister? Why are you looking for a job? <laughs> right? You know, so the key here is <clears throat> you have many things you want to do, fine. Pick one of them. Now, the one that you pick doesn't have to be something you're passionate about. Passion is not the market, the market does not respond to passion. Passion is good, but the market responds to solutions, right? I know somebody who, one of my clients, I've been working with them seven years. They built a hundred billionaire business in a business that has zero passion in. Zero, no passion, nothing. <laughs> you know, but she built a hundred billionaire business out of it. You know, the market responds. Passion allows you to stay through the phase where you're not making any money. But if you're disciplined enough, you don't need passion. Find something that can be profitable. Find something that can succeed at and get out. You know, but if you are young, you come member, you can still follow passion. If you are here, you have children, you have, don't follow passion, follow money. <laughs> when you have money, you cannot use your money to go and follow your passion. <laughs> okay, can I take the last question? Wow. Oh, yeah, the market responds to passion. The market has, market, there's nobody that has entered into your office and is paying you money because they think you're passionate. Nonsense. My client, when a client calls me to work with them, they, they, they have absolutely no respect for my passion. It's only if I can produce a result. Wow, this is, this is amazing. Thank you so very much, sir. Um, I'm sure we are all blown away. For the sake of mm -hmm. our time, we still have um, three other speakers. I'm not cajoling people to ask. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Uh, Thank you. I'll be contacting you after this. We really, 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 re please in the chat room, can you drop one key takeaway from this session? It doesn't have just one. Me, I have like a whole book written. That thing he was talking about the past, and we'll be x raying it next month. As he, when he said it, I wrote it down again. That thing about network, you know. It's something I'm really practicing, and that is why I'm in your DM like this. So that you have to focus on the people you're associating with. Oh, I'm very deliberate. I tell my crew that you know why I know I cannot be poor because of the people that have intentionally entered their circle. Immediately, I, when I see people like Mr. Ezekiel and I'm listening to him, I'm hearing all these figures, I'm hearing all this data. I know I cannot be poor, that this land is answering to all of us. Thank you for all the positive things that you've told us we have people of other nationality here because, but we have majorly Africans here. So I think this actually speaks to Africa, Mother Nigeria, that the way we look at things will determine what we get out of the thing. 
that is so, 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 so strong that the same land that people are screaming and shouting in the same land, so much is going out of it. Thank you. Focus on your standard. You can rewrite your past because it did not happen to you, but that was amazing. FJ says he needs four stomach to digest what you release. Thank you so much. Sir. So for the sake of our time, we'll be bringing up this next person eh, when I met her. When I met her, it was meeting her. Thank you. You people, you would hear. So she's the first person that I have met in my entire life that teaches Yoruba and is earning multiple digits in dollars. And we are so grateful that she's here to cut us off because we'll still move into the questions and answers and discussion time very well. I want to invite Mrs. Oluwa Damilare Igbayi Loye. But before I invite her, let me read her profile. Today I've told you that I'm the one reading profile because I want you to really feel the vibe. Oluwa Damilare Igbayi Loye is the founder of Akonilede Yoruba, a brand registered in Nigeria and the USA, established to provide a learning platform for children and adults to learn how to communicate in Yoruba language preserve its values and connect with their audience. She holds a bachelor degree in Yoruba language from the University of Adwekiti and a master degree in literature in Yoruba from University of Ibadan. Oluwada Milare is passionate about helping individuals to communicate in their mother tongue, especially Yoruba language. This passion led her to establish Akonilede Yoruba in the year 2018. Since then, Akonilede Yoruba has continued to grow year in, year out with hundreds of students across different countries, including the US, United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, United Arab Emirates, and so on. Oluwada Milare has authored two books, namely Ede Yoruba, Eko Mia Koko, Yoruba Language, My First Lesson, and Orowa. A day wa, our conversation, our language. Both books have become references for beginners. She is a recipient of the Meritorious Award of National Education Advancement Ambassador by Nigeria National Education Award. She is an alumni of the Future Female Business School Program slash UK Nigeria Tech Hub and currently a member of African Women Entrepreneurship Cooperative. Quote five, Oluwada Milare provides advisory and consultation services for small business. She has also trained many language teachers on how to earn income with their language skills from a tech impact and impact and end course. Ladies and gentlemen, on this auspicious platform, hey, hey, too much swagger, hey, with read energy with your favorite emoji. Please join me in welcoming Oluwa Damilare Igbailoye. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for having me. Good evening, everyone. Ajake kinge de Yoruba, ekro leo, eka leo, eka so. How will you know Yoruba code if I did not greet you now? <laughs> so what I'm, I'm just greeting you based on the time of the day. Thank you for having me. All the team working behind Rig community. Thank you so so much. So the topic before me is how can we build strong business? You know, and um, the pitfalls that we face as startup and how to overcome all these pitfalls. So I have a question. My question is that: Do you have any business here? If yes, just type in that business. Type the name of that business. Someone might want to reach out to you. Just type in with business and how many years have you been in business? Type it. Okay, I may tell you. I've been in business for two years. Type it. Let me just see. Let me see if that business owner are here and you are ready to earn millions that Mr. Ezekiel was talking about. As I was mentioning those, those figures, I'm like, okay, when you speak, I'm Larry, you are the next person to make all these billions. Like, from let's move from million to, you know, you understand, in dollars. Oh, five years. Oh, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Please put it in the chat. Let me see, let me see, let me see. Have you been able to, um, you know, the other one, Mr. Ezekiel said that we should have a goal, have your own vision board. 
Do we have vision board? Have you ever imagined that one day you will earn one million on that your business, five million, right? Have you ever imagined that? Have you ever, yes or no? Have you earned that that, that, that you, you wish to have earned? Because for me, the first time I earned one million, the all, everybody in my house knew that something changed. Teaching Yoruba, the language that you are speaking to someone on the streets, someone that you know, doesn't, you know, all those things, your friends just communicate, how are you doing? I'm just greeting you. The language that you commonize is what someone like me, and I am helping other teachers, you know, making millions. Like when my teachers collect salary, virtue will leave me. <laughs> you know, when you're paying millions for teachers that are teaching Yoruba language, it is not a joke. Now, let me tell you this, I have failed. I have had challenges and there have been several pitfalls that I have fallen into just because I am trying to fine tune what I am doing and find myself. So I have seen the chat, I see, I see someone saying that I sell here, I'm a photographer, all those, I, I'm a teacher. Okay, I've seen someone say I cook soup and stew. Do you know that in the last two, three years, people are not open to buying soup. Somebody like me, I'm not open to it. But guess what? Last week, I paid for one bowl of soup for 28,000, two liter. Yeah, what I would not naturally do before. It shows that something is changing. Now, let me go into my, into my, uh, my, my slide. Please permit me to be able to share. <clears throat> um, okay. Thank you. Can you see my slide, please? Yes or yes? Sorry, can you see my slide? Oh, yes, awesome, awesome. Okay, so let's, I'm, I want to be very, very fast. I want to be very, very fast. I will try as much as possible. Data from BLS show that approximately 20% of new businesses fail during the first two years of being open. Yes, I did like five businesses then and it failed. So my data was part of, my story is part of this data and the rest, right? It says only 25% of new businesses make it to 15 years or more. I am not yet five years with this brand according to the Yoruba. We are just four, we clocked four this November. And this that other data says from BLH, same one, shows that approximately 20% of new businesses failed during the first two years of being open, 45% during the first five years and 65 during the first 10 years. Only 25% of new businesses make it to the 15 years or more. The Dangote we are talking about today, the hotel dollars, the um, um, Zenith Bank, all those people, you know, they've been able to scale through all these things. Now let's check some of, some of the factors that cause these failures in startups. If you are here, you are running any business, I want to assume that that current business you are doing is not the first one you have done. You have probably tried something, but you are not seeing the results you want, and then you jump to another. We have been jumping. I have jumped before. Do I have someone like that in the house? We have tried like two other business before your current one. Do I have anyone like that? Now, this is it. Okay, 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 okay. These are some of the pitfalls that we fall into as startup. Now, number one, our business looks complex. Or will I say, we are one human being, but you want to do everything all by yourself. My pastor, Pastor Sam Adem, always says something that um, you want to do like El Shaddai, and then you will die. If you want to do everything all by yourself, just imagine that, uh, let me quickly share my story. When I started at Fun in the Yoruba, my husband encouraged me to start. I'm like me, teach children Yoruba. I just want to do music like Shola, listen. I want to, I sing, I want people to know me. See me, patterning, uh, patterning my life like um, someone else. I'm not trying to find my own path. And then she said, he said, try, teach these children. I said, I cannot. So one day I wore a shirt and then I wrote this according to Yoruba. After a lot of issue, I decided to, you know, start it. And um, my neighbor's children, I realized that she was struggling to read the name. I'm like, Ben Misola, Misok with Sandra, or... Oh. Sarah, baby, so lauru ko yoba, and then you are struggling to pronounce this. This is a problem, and I must create a solution. Like with my full chest, 
And with the passion that I have for music, I just transferred that like, no, I have to create a solution from this. So if you are here in Nigeria, you are struggling, how much more those that are not outside Nigeria? And that was how I was able to create my own niche. I said, no, the audience I am facing are those that are not here in Nigeria. And if they are here, they don't have any knowledge of the language. And that was how I started the brand. Now, I was not the only person. I was not the only person doing the work. My husband and then my brother and then my sister from an adopted sister. So at the end of the month, I will pay them from my soup allowance because no parent was paying me. I resigned from a paid employment and nothing to do. So I was teaching this Yoruba language. No, in fact, the friend that I talked about and I was teaching our children, she was not paying me. I offered to do it for free. So sometimes your service is very, very important. Remember, Mr. Izike said, develop capacity to be useful. You know, I developed that capacity that I know. I have to do this thing for free for now to get into the market. And I was paying my brother and this my doctor sister from my soup money that my husband would give me just to encourage them. Oh, we need to design a flyer. Okay, I will teach. So I'll sit for the camera like this. She'll be teaching something. You will do this. So I was not taking them for granted. I started with a team of human beings. So I don't know where you are in your business. Are you doing it all by yourself? Are you doing it all by yourself? This is one of the pitfalls that you fall in. I know you are tired. You cannot think. You don't know your own strengths. Let me move on. Number two, you want to quickly end the money, Jesus. Some of us just want to climb the ladder. Pa, 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 pa. I was teaching Yoruba for almost one, one year, three months, and I was not any one naira. No one naira. And at a point, I was frustrated. I was tired. But there are people are watching me. I would post this content to different platforms, YouTube, Instagram. And then a parent reached out. She said, in 2020, she said, I've been watching you for the past one year. I thought you will um, stop, but now I can trust you that you will teach my children and you are consistent with this thing. Now, how much do you want to charge? Money, Jesus, Holy Spirit. What are you saying? And that was it. I gave her the quote and then she said, don't worry, I'm going to pay. I was not in a rush to make the money as fast as quick as some of us here. And then another one, comparison. You are comparing your own soup business to someone that is doing probably small chops. Your audience are different. If you are doing soup, I am your audience. I am no, I am your um, um, target market, um, um, target audience. You should sell soup to me, not someone that they are going to party, except they, are, they have, you have married women amongst them, right? Someone selling a, 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 a provision. Comparing him or herself to someone that is a doctor, their audience are different. And you need to understand and sit with your brand to know what works. Okay, what can I do to make this thing work? What will I bring in to this my business so that it will give me what I want? You cannot do what everybody is doing. As I'm in this language industry, I don't do what everybody else are doing. People that are in the language industry with me. The way I post, the way I show up, I show up even from the hospital bed. There has been days that I'll be teaching students and some pretty will be like, what's going on? I said, oh, I'm in the hospital with my daughter or with myself or my husband. I don't give excuses by saying, oh no, this, da, 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 no, no, no. And I don't compare myself. Though it, it will come, but I will not allow it to sit. As human, as business owner, you can be looking at, ah, I need a milk. Do you know what the person is doing back end? Do you know the sleepless night that they do? Do you know the investment that they do? And they get that result, and then you are comparing you. You just show up, maybe when you need the money to say, I'm selling this. No, it can't work. Let me quickly run. You are not willing to invest. This is another pitfall. Some of us will like free things, just free. Oh. <laughs> Steve Harris said, what? You are not willing to spend on yourself. You should not demand it from people. If you're not willing to spend 50K to learn something, to improve yourself, you cannot demand someone to pay you 100 or 50,000 or 200,000 or even 1 million. The first time I charged a client over uh, uh, almost 500,000, yes, 500,000 from teaching you, but the person is the US. <laughs> 
Do you know in my head, I'm like, sure, would this person pay or not? Would this person pay or not? And then something tells me that I'm like, you've been paying coaches to learn. You've been paying different people to, 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 to optimize your, 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 your processes, to improve everything. So don't be afraid that this person will not pay you this app in video, teaching you river. And are, you still, are we still here? This person paid. He paid in dollar. And when I converted it, half a million. Uh, it's not story. It is not, I'm telling you real story. <laughs> Those are the clients that I teach, right? I want to quickly move fast, move fast, move fast. You're always complaining. Ha, huh? so you heard Mr. Ezekiel now, you're saying there's no money in Nigeria. Who told you there's no money in Nigeria? You see, I've worked with um, Lebanese, you know, they come in their own dress to this country, and we, we are going to other country. So I also think about it, what's going on? God, please show us what are we not seeing? Remove this scale that we are not seeing what we have right stop complaining stop complaining these are some of the pitfalls that we fall into and eh, they're not doing how did you prepare your 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 business how do you present it how now i have talked about the problem let's we talk about the solution i'm trying to be fast 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 number one you need to invest in knowledge you have to pay trust me we're on this call and you're getting this for free congratulations if I am having a one-on-one -on -one session with anyone, I will tell you how many minutes they are going to pay me, even though I have other coaching business, but asking for my um, expertise, asking for my, 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 my clue or something, can you tell me what? I will tell you, you will pay me. And this is what I will charge, right? So be ready to invest. Number two, be ready to learn, build capacity. You can't Assume that you will gain or have everything you have all by yourself without improving and investing on yourself to learn. Knowledge is powerful. Trust me, what I am doing today, what I am, um, everything I have been able to do today, I did not learn it while I was in the rest of the battle or at Drake City. They only taught me yoga, but that's it. Carry your certificate. Bye. One day I challenged my lecture. I said, Ma, you didn't teach us how to turn this knowledge to money. And then she was like, ah, this girl. And I was so angry. Now, all these students that are currently in, in school, they are just learning the language and then they don't even know what to do after, the, after they, they, they graduate. So you have to go extra mile to learn how to market your business, brand your business, you know, just do things. I like it. Okay, I need to grow in this area. Is it your processes? Is it how people reach you? Look for it. And you have to build relationships. Mr. Ezekiel talked about that. Trust me, where I am today, it is about relationship with our clients and our staff. We've gotten our good and best clients from parents referring other parents. Like, oh, Mrs. Lapa just said this, this. If I tested anything that you're doing and I'm, I'm impressed, I will tell others. I'm a fan of posting people's business on my status. Like, I will just post it. This person is doing this, come and patronize, blah, 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 and all. But if I'm not in good relationship with them or they are not with me, I will not be able to talk about them or someone else will reach out to them. No, it's not possible, right? So build relationship, right? Number two, have a plan. I don't know why Mr. Ezekiel, maybe just, he looked at all my, all my, <laughs> but it's okay. Have a plan, have a goal. Do you know that I wrote it somewhere that one day I will earn $50 million dollars. Now, I am checking my, my vision board. I'm like, okay, damn, Larry, God is helping you. Just move on. Just move on. Have a plan. How much do you want to? Sorry, I'm sorry for this, my Yoruba interference, but I can't make it up. I'm so sorry. But Jay, you can't say you want to end 1 million by the end of um, 2023. And what you are doing now is not commensurate to that million, 1 million that you're ambitioned to have, right? Have a plan. Write it down. Take action. Don't just say only can't with the board. I've written it down. It's on my board, and that is it. No, you have to take deliberate action by advertising, by uh, and building your processes, by getting the right thing to work with you. Like I have amazing teachers. They are almost fifteen that are working with me. Aside from my non teaching stuff, they are doing so well. And I was just like they're like sisters. You wouldn't even know that. She is she their mommy or whatever it is? In fact, I even have someone that is much more older than me working with us. So you have to build vision with your clients, your staff, people around you, everyone, and go to places to learn. Let me quickly rush. Book for a strategy session. Everybody here, you need a strategy session. I mean a one-on-one. -on -one. I'm not talking about Bobo like this. We are almost 40 here. No, I'm talking about one-on-one. -on -one. Let me show you. One day, 
I saw a post on Instagram and person tagged a guy that helped him with his processing, processes and all. And then I reached out, sir, please, can you help me? He said, my session is 50K for 30 minutes. 50K. That was sometimes last day. And the only thing that this person told me was that I said, I'm very, I am not seeing enough of you teaching a lot. You are more aware of talking about the classes, how the classes is going on. I said, I've been teaching, just go back, go back, go back to my Instagram, go down, 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 2018, 2019, 2020. You see a lot of me teaching. He said, no. He said, I should come to your page on Instagram. And I will look at it like this. And the first three, four, five um, posts, I am seeing you teaching me something. With that, I know that you are educating me about this language. Even if I don't want to learn, looking at this will inspire me to sign up for something. That was an eye opener for me. If I did not have that session, I would have known that, oh, so people look out to learn when they come to you, not just to say, come and buy, come and buy, come and buy, every time we are buying, what are you giving us? Give value to, right? And then do the work, do the work. There's a popular work, um, um, poem in your revival work. I don't want to read it. And lastly, join a community. I'm not talking about free community. I don't know for read if it's a free or paid community. Um, Mr. Ezekiel said it that you should find a group. Of, I don't know how, how he put it, but it's in line with this. Join a community where you can pay for knowledge, for insights, for, for lessons, because you can't do it alone. You can't build whatever you want to build alone. Yesterday, I was showing my coach how we have grown from this to this to this. And then she was like, wow, I'm talking about Koshana Deshaq, and some of you might know her. And then she said, Kamilari, I am, I am just happy for you. Now, let's leave the money. It's about the, the, the brand, the people, and the technology that we're putting together to make sure that this is our own part of the industry. Your rubber language is, you know, is preserved. Children and their parents are able to communicate with, with it. And the language did not go into extinction. So I am doing all I could back in to make sure that I am doing the right thing a lot. So my um, listener, I want to encourage you that you should join a community, a paid community. You can start from 5K every month or 10K. Look for it, one that works for your current situation, not the way you think. You have to be deliberate and intentional about your life, right? So this is that prayer, I will not talk about it. And lastly, trust me, prayer. Prayer, well, I know that some people don't believe in prayer, but I do, I do. I know days that I will go on and on, I'll keep confessing good things about the language, you know, some parent things will come up and some client will not just be happy upon everything you are doing. Aside that, the overall goal is God to bless whatever it is you are doing. I'll tell my staff, I say, when this Iru, Iru is a locust bee that I'm selling. People will know me because I will carry it on top of my head. I'm going to do it with my, with my full chest, trusting God that it will bless the work of my hand. So I ask you, what do you want? As a business owner, what do you want from your business before the end of 2023? Thank you. Wow, 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 wow. Please, can I see your reactions in the chat room? I was telling my people that, yes, they have to meet you. Hey, hey. like how, 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 how? Eh? Seven digits in dollars. Teaching Yoruba, a day Yoruba, he cannot. There is God. Though. This is amazing. We will be going into the question after, but we want everybody to speak, then we'll not come on the, you, okay? Well, you can see the way everybody's wanting G. They start sleeping on the bicycle. Thank you so very much, Ma. That is an amazing, 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 amazing session. I was writing and writing and writing. One of the things she said, and we'll be talking about that is, your service is important. Yes, Ma, read community is free and, for us, this is our way of giving back to, I also bring up the other speakers, giving back to the society. While Ezekiel was speaking, one of the things that we noticed as a big challenge is there is too much negativity in the air such that 
People do not know that people like Oluwada Milari exist. People do not know that Ezekiel exists. We are bringing up Dr. Ebi now. You'll be hearing them. We are bringing up Ayodele. You'll be, we have amazing people doing. I tell people that people are making money and they are not thieves. They are not criminals. If you look at one of the pillars that we have at Read, it is connecting mentees to mentors. There are lots of hungry people out there. They are following the wrong people on social media they are, and they are constantly filling their lives with negativity and not moving forward. If you are looking at the chat room, you can see the bustle. This is one thing we do every month and people's minds, their perspectives are changing. As um, Ezekiel said, your association is changing and it's changing for the better. Because right now you've met Olu Adamila and you've realized that this house that you are speaking, you are sleeping on a bicycle, you can turn it to a war, a war giddy. Because I told you guys that this one is full webinar, so we are taking our time. The next person I will be bringing up is Dr. Ebi. Hmm. Olu Adamila has already started when she was talking about strategy. So we are, we are bringing up strategy himself. I'm privileged to be in the same community with Dr. Ebi. And as Damilari said, to further emphasize that you can't be doing everything free, 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 awoof, awoof, awoof. There are people that we only meet them because of the amount you've paid. I was privileged to be in a community to meet Dr. Ebi and is an amazing person. Because of our time, let me quickly read his profile. Dr. Ebi Offrey has been a medical doctor for over 20 years and a business and blue ocean strategy consultant for about 11 years. He has a degree in medicine and surgery from the University of Ibadan, Nigeria, a certificate in geriatric care from the University of Benin, and a master's in business administration from University, from Oxy University, Malaysia, and trained blue ocean strategy practitioner. He is the CEO and founder of Gero Care Solutions Limited, a health tech company pioneering medical inclusion by leveraging technology to provide access to medical care to underserved segments of people across Africa, beginning with elderly and those in rural area. Gero Care was selected as a top 20 finalist in the African Business Euro competition 2021, organized by the Jack Ma Foundation, one of the top 50 business innovations in Africa, exhibited at the Africa Innovation Summit 2018 Kigali, Rwanda, one of the top 30 African health innovation by the World Health Organization, showcased at the World Health Forum in Cape Verde in March 2019. The winner of the Best Nigerian Startup Ecosystem Tour, organized by Africa Arena, and featured at Africa Summit 2019 in Cape Town, South Africa in November, 2019. Top 20 finalists for the Africa Business Heroes Award 2021 by Jack Ma Foundation. And most recently, finalist for the Kofi Annan Award for innovation in Africa 2020, amongst others. He's also a public speaker, startup coach, slash mentor to various startup accelerator programs locally and internationally, including MIT, Next Innovation with Japan, and Lagos Innovate. He's equally author of series of books in the Dr. A.B. Office Business Advisory, Advisory Series. Ladies and gentlemen, on this auspicious platform. Join me in welcoming Dr. Avi Offrey. Yeah, welcome, sir. All right. Thank you very much. Um, just in the short time, I've learned quite a lot already. That shows the benefit of this event. You cannot stop learning. So thank you very much for inviting me. And thank you for placing me as third so I could learn a bit about everybody else before I came up. So as has been introduced, my name is Dr. A.B. Offrey. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Gerald Care. And for the purpose of this session, I will just briefly introduce my business because to be the case study for most of the things I'm going to say going forward. So Gerald Care basically is a digital health platform that makes it extremely easy for Nigerians anywhere in the eye of the world to provide health care for their parents in Nigeria. So the key problem we're solving is the fact that as a Nigerian, really before the age of 40, there is a 75% chance you will lose one or both your parents 
to untimely death or have them severely incapacitated by one condition or another simply because there's an absence of care for these elderly people. And this is the problem my partners and I decided to solve. And that's why we launched General Care. So when I go forward and I'm giving an example to understand what the business does. So I'm supposed to be talking about important strategies uh, for startups, but because of time, I'll focus on just one, which is the importance of identifying the problem. Because if you don't identify the right problem to work on, all other strategies fall flat. One of the best um, laws that I use is the law of income. And it says that you will be paid in direct proportion to the amount of value you deliver according to the marketplace. So whatever business you do, you will be paid in direct proportion to the amount of value you deliver. So there has to be value and it has to be delivered. You can't create value and keep it. You must deliver it and according to the marketplace. So the marketplace is not a place or a location. It's actually the people that need your service. So when I say target market, I mean those that need your service, are willing to buy your service and can afford your service. If they don't need your service, but can afford it and are willing to buy it, they are not your market because they will not buy for long. If they need it, but can't afford it, they are not your market. If they need it, can afford it, but are not willing to buy it, they are not your market. So the people you should focus on are those that need what you are selling, can afford to buy it, and are willing to purchase it. Again, we need to understand what constitutes value. So when we say it should be of value to your target market, what constitutes value to these markets? So usually four key things constitute value. We have the demand, we have the supply, we have the quantity and the quality. For the benefit of this session, I'll focus mainly on demand, which is why are people buying what you're selling? So first of all, why do people start businesses? Many times people start a business because that is what they can do, or because that's what the money in their hand can set up, or because that's what's in trend. But the question you should ask yourself is that the fact that you can do something, does that mean people want it? The fact that it's trending, does that mean people want it? The fact that that's the only thing you can do, does that mean people want it? There is a phenomenon in tech we call the SOAP, SOAP, which is solution in search of a problem. Many people create a solution and begin to look for the problem it solves. So uh, a few years ago or some years back, it happened to me also. So I launched a service called Sphinx, Sphinx Weekly Health Tips. And basically the idea of that service was way before all this MTN value added services thing. So what I decided to do, being a doctor, was create a platform whereby you can subscribe and get information about a particular health condition. So for instance, you want to know about hypertension. What you do is subscribe for 500 Naira. And every week, you receive an SMS informing you about that condition, such that by the end of six months, you are well aware about it. Everybody I asked said, wonderful idea. But the moment I launched it, not one single person subscribed for the program. I can ask somebody, borrow me 500 Naira, or give me 500 Naira. He will say, yes, take it. But that same person will not subscribe. And so the question was, it was a solution, but nobody had that problem at all that I wanted to solve. So you should ask yourself, the business you are doing or the business you want to go into, what problem is it solving? Fortunately, the other two speakers mentioned that also. The solution you are providing must be solving a problem. So now, how do you identify what business to go into? How do you identify what problem to solve? In one of my most recent books called Attract Customers and Investors Like a Magnet, I identified two key ways of identifying problems. One is called experiential. The other is called postulatory. Experiential basically means you have to have experienced the problem yourself or you know somebody closely who has experienced the problem and you know the person needs a solution to that problem. So for general care, for instance, how did I come up with that idea and create a solution? So a few years ago, in the space of one year, my father had two massive strokes. 
And that was not because there's nothing I could have done about it. I was simply living and walking somewhere else at the time. Subsequently, my mother called me. She told me her blood pressure was high and her blood sugar was high. But there is something she said next that jolted me. She said I had neglected them. And like many of us, I thought that was impossible. How could I neglect my parents? But after closely analyzing my life, I realized that while I focused on business and my career, I had subconsciously neglected these people. We also realized that millions of people living and working far away from where their parents are. And the only time they hear anything is when something goes wrong. And so we thought to ourselves, is there a way whereby no matter where we are in the world, we can provide health care for our parents? And that's how we came up with Gerald Care, to enable Nigerians wherever they are in the world, subscribe for regular doctor home visits for their parents in Nigeria using the Gerald Care mobile application. Again, we noticed that in our age group, the truth is that many of us had actually lost, or many people had actually lost one or both parents. And so it was a pressing need they had. And I had a means of solving it. And so I realized this is a problem that is pressing and something I can solve with my skill sets. And so I went into it. In your own industry also, you can decide what are the problems people are going through that I'm actually facing at the moment that I can solve. Identify this problem and look at your skill set. It does not matter if you have not been doing it. If all that matters is the solution must be able to be preferred by you based on your skill sets. You don't look for problems in the health, in health sector if you're an engineer or electrician. You look for something they are facing in that exact area where you have an expertise in. So the number one is identify a problem via personal experience or experience of somebody close to you. The second is postulatory, meaning you speak to a lot of people. It's very amazing how many times you start a business, but you realize that the people that start this business have never one day spoken to the person they feel has the problem. There is something Ezekiel also mentioned about having multiple businesses and deciding to pick one. The question is, how do you choose that one? It's by following these things I'm talking about. Being able to identify that there's an actual problem to be solved. You don't go into it because that's what you have the skills for, or that's what the money you have can do, or that's what's in trend. You go into it because it's a problem that has been identified. Once a problem has been identified, when you provide that solution, the people that have that problem are already awaiting markets for the solution. So that's the second. The first experiential, the second postulatory. Now you have identified the problem. You now have to find out is the problem even solvable at all? Because my business, for instance, in 2021, 2020, or when I started in 2017, the problem could be solved because there is now technology to support it. Because the way my business is structured, I have doctors all across the country. We have over 750 doctors on our platform in every state in Nigeria. There's no way you can go where we are not. But that's only possible because of the way technology is at the moment. All doctors have the mobile applications and can link to us. If there was no internet, there's no way I would have solved that problem. So what problem do you identify? Is it solvable? Are the things necessary to solve that problem currently available? Or can you tweak currently existing solutions to match up with what you intend to do? So I was in a solution a, a session recently where somebody was asking, why would we shy away from problems that cannot be solved? If we keep on shying away from these problems, how will the world progress? But my answer to them was, are you in business to invent or to start a business that is sustainable? Because if you want to be an inventor, it's fine. You can invent a solution, but the money might not come to you in your own generation. The example the person gave was the Wright brothers. They came up with the ability to fly or flying aircraft and so on and so forth. But I put it to you that Wright brothers did not make millions from that business. They just invented it. So if you want to be someone that invents, it's fine. However, if you want to create a business that can make money for you at this point in time, whatever you want to solve needs to be solvable either today or in the nearest future. So first, you identify the problem, either by experiential, experiencing it yourself, or speaking to enough people to identify the problems they have. Again, I guarantee you that if you speak to enough people, you will realize that all their problems fall into six categories. 
whatever problem they have in your industry, you will be able to put it into one of six pegs. You now realize that after you align it to identify the peg with the largest number of people, and that is the business you focus on. Then you determine, is this business solvable or not? If the business is solvable, then you move to the next level. How intense is the problem for them? Because many times you realize that you are solving the problem, but actually without you, they were not having any solution to that problem and they were okay with their lives. So the competition is not doing anything at all and they are still existing. So how will your solution help them? So how intense is the problem for them? So what I like to describe it as is that there are problems that are seen as finger cut and paper cuts or fingers being chopped off. The problem I described for general care, meaning that before the age of 40, over 75% of Nigerians will lose one or both their parents to untimely death or have at least one of them incapacitated by a serious medical condition. That is a serious problem. That's a finger being chopped off. When you hear that problem, you want to help. If you have that problem, you want it solved. However, if I had a problem like the first one I mentioned, we are providing some information on a health condition. You are not even bothered or thinking about it. So the two of them are problems, but one is a paper cut, one is a finger being chopped off. The question is the problem you are trying to solve. How intense is it for the person you are solving it for? Once you've identified that, the next is to determine how frequently they have that problem. So if the problem is intense, but they have the problem only once in 10 or 15 years or once in five years. It may not be a good business to go into because it means every single time you need to get a new user to buy the product to have a sustainable income from it. You need to find a problem that is intense enough for them and has an increased frequency. So one is intensity. The other is how frequent do they have the problem? So if you have a problem that is intense, but not frequent, you need to take a look at it and provide a way whereby you can add an avenue to provide the solution to them more frequently. So let's take a look at the companies, for instance, that um, sell printers. So those companies will realize the price of printers are going less and less, but the money they make is more in the ink. So they sell the printer, but they know they can get ink from you regularly. And the ink we buy now, you realize doesn't last as long as it used to last because they want you to keep on coming back for it. Because the problem of buying a printer is just once. You might not buy a printer in the nearest future after you buy the first one, but you will buy ink regularly. So you must determine one, how intense is the problem? And two, how frequent are they using that solution? So in a nutshell, I'm just trying to make it, I'm timing myself over here. So I have like a four minutes left to ensure I don't go beyond the time I have allotted to me. What we must remember as a takeaway is before you start any business, first of all, think of the law of income. The law of income states that you will be paid in direct proportion to the amount of value you deliver to the customers or the amount of value according to the marketplace. So first of all, you must deliver this value. And second of all, your value is predicated on the size or the magnitude or intensity of the problem you are solving. And you must understand that your target market are people that need your solution, can afford your solution, and are willing to buy your solution. So having understood this, you must first of all also identify how to find these problems. So as I stated, when you go out there and you're thinking of what problem to solve, you will think, what problem am I experiencing that I have the capacity or capability to solve? If I'm not experiencing it personally, do I know somebody close by or close to me that has experienced this problem and I have the capacity to solve it? Similar to what the last speaker said about seeing a neighbor that was unable to read the description on her shirts, even though the person was Yoruba and the writing was in Yoruba. She determined that at that point, that was a major problem and that problem needed to be solved. And the truth was that that problem was not unique to that person. There are a lot of other people experiencing the same problem. Recently, somebody asked me, but I'm a tailor. What kind of problem can I identify? Unfortunately, we know that in tailoring industry, for instance, there are key problems customers always face. 
the disappointments, the lateness, and all types of things. That is a key problem in that area that you can go into and solve as a tailor. So you you can say I'm a tailor, but the problem I'm solving is the trust and reliability that other tailors do not have. That's a problem people have. You mentioned fishery. What are the problems people have in that industry? You know, do not go in there because it's something you can do. You go in there because you've identified a gap in that market. There's something that people around need that is not being provided. And that was why you went into it. You then determine if the problem is actually solvable. If it's not solvable, look for the next best problem. If it's solvable, you take on that problem as what you want to solve. You then identify how intense is the problem for the person. Is it intense enough for them to repeatedly come back to you for a solution? Is this something they will pay you good money for? I forgot to mention, you look at the target market. How large is the market for this problem? You've identified the problem. You've identified it solvable. Now, the size of people available that have the problem, how large are they? If they are not so large, the question you need to ask yourself is that I will charge a premium for my products. If I charge a premium for my products, though the number of customers are not much, are they enough to pay that high price that I can sustain my business? If they are not enough, then you need to actually find a product that suits their own needs. And then you look at the frequency of the problem they have. How frequent do they have it? So in a nutshell, that's a quick summary. Identify the problem by experiential or postulatory. Identify if the problem is solvable. Identify how large the market is. Identify how, how intense the problem is and how frequent they have that problem. So for the person I mentioned that is a copper, for instance, out of all the ideas you have, you need to make sure they check all these boxes to ensure or you go into the right business. Many times when you have multi-potential or have multiple ideas, there may be a mistake of going to the wrong thing. And like uh, Ezekiel said, you stay in there for five years. But however, if you pick the wrong idea in the first place, you spend five years doing the wrong thing. So it's key to find a business that is solving a problem. That's the bottom line. Without the business solving a problem, no matter the strategy you adopt to it, that business will not work. So I think that's, that's my time. So I'll wait for the Q&A session later on to take any questions. Wow, 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 wow. <laughs> you can see the high in the section. Please, can I have reactions in the chat room? This is it, Abby. Okay, this is it. Like, this one is Renma. And this is just one strategy. You know, he said he doesn't have time. So it was only one thing he was able to transform now. Beautiful. Wow. Dr. Ebi, this is simply amazing. Please, let's be getting our questions ready. A while ago, I wrote an article on LinkedIn and I said dreams come true. Because truly in my life, we've heard about focus, we've heard about right, we've and I can so align with all of these things. But I'm not the one talking today. I have this big titles talking, but for this person that I'm bringing up, the summary is dreams come true. The first time I listened to you, so I came across your YouTube, your video, an interview of you on YouTube, and my mind blew. You guys have been hearing amazing things. You're about to hear even more amazing things. And I'm like, wow, there is this so much opportunities. He was speaking about is um food prop business and i was like god you know the way you just see somebody on youtube and randomly it doesn't look like you can connect i'm glad this evening that one of my dreams is coming true and on this platform i have the honor or i'm sure you people are understanding why i'm the one reading the profile now i have the honor of welcoming ayodele olajiga let me read his profile Ayodele Olajiga works with business owners and executives to drive top line growth and operational transformation in their businesses. He does this because he passionately believes that business growth is essential to societal transformation. It also allows him to leverage his experience in management consulting, investment banking, and starting and running his own business. He's a lead consultant at Leverly Consulting Limited. He's a board member of Teach for Nigeria, 
TFN, a non-profit organization focused on developing a movement of leaders across Nigeria who are committed to ending educational inequity. Co-founder and a member of Board of Trustees for this not-for-profit, supporting the executive team in setting out strategy, raising funds, and raising awareness of the organization's mission. He's, uh, he's also the co-founder of Food Pro Limited, founded in 2010. It has broken the five, it has even broken the 10 years ban, which is a cashew snack business based in Nigeria. Ladies and gentlemen, on this auspicious platform, join me in welcoming Ayodele Olajiga. You're welcome, sir. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. Can you hear me? I, I wasn't sure if my... Yes, if... we can. Okay, excellent. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, and thanks for having me. And thanks for thanks for that generous uh, introduction. Um, I, I, I'm not sure how much time I've been allotted, but I will try and keep this brief. I usually believe that you, you actually can help more people when you're answering questions which are specific uh, to their situation versus uh, just uh, giving you, um, I guess, maybe academic points. Uh, but what I've been asked to do is to talk to you about how to, um, how to build a global brand. I think th that's what the topic is. Now that's a very, I mean, that's a very big topic, and it's also a very big topic for this, um, for this, uh, for the amount of time we have. So what I've decided to do is to talk to you about three points that I think are very important in terms of if you're trying to build, be it local or global, whatever it is, if you're trying to build a brand, three things that I think you need to you need to focus on to ensure you do that. In, inherently, also, these three things are also three things that are important for your business uh, to survive anyways, because your brand is essential to A, you know, what kind of customers you'll be able to serve, what kind of um, value you'll be able to get from them. And as some of the other speakers have told you, uh, the value you will get is a function of the value you're also putting out there. So it's important that you set up your brand, you know, to... Um, to get the kind of value you are ready to deliver. So if you're not ready to deliver, uh, the, if you're not ready to deliver the value, then forget about trying to, uh, to trying to build that kind of brand. Uh, and I will use examples from some of the work I've done, either personally or clients that I've worked with, to kind of explain that. So the three words. The first one is clarity. Now, oftentimes, you know, when I say this, people are like, oh, yeah, but uh, clarity is very simple. Just get clear on what you're trying to do or what you want. The reality is that the, the amount of ambiguity that surrounds us, right? If you, if you are honest with yourself, the amount of ambiguity that surrounds you that exists in your business, uh, it's probably, if you, if you scale it, ambiguity versus clarity, ambiguity is probably the larger percentage of what is around you. And that's from anything from, first of all, who are you serving? Who's the customer you're serving? You hear people tell you, oh, yeah, I'm, serving everybody and, and if you're serving everybody you're serving no one and the reason why they always say that is it doesn't mean that your product or service doesn't help everyone it just means that it's very difficult to communicate with everybody right but if you are if i'm communicating with uh you know like you know the uh the lady that uh olu adam larry of the you know by the way i like that business um uh yoruba language who the, the specific audience, there are many people that need to learn Yoruba, both in Nigeria and outside Nigeria. But as I understand from what she was saying, the specific focus is the one offshore. Now, if she's trying to communicate with them or trying to put communication out, it's very easy to determine, okay, what kind of pain points do people who are offshore have? You know, first of all, it's, it's probably the fact that there's probably nowhere for, if it's for their kids, there's probably nowhere for their kids to practice Yoruba. There's no, so they can't go to any school. So you can tailor the message to meet that. So so I always say that the, the first one is clarity. And that clarity just means that if you already have a business, who does that business serve? What problem is that business solving? And important thing is that once you answer that question, it helps you around, you know, 
your brand, communicating your brand, it helps you in the way you set up your operations. I mean, I'll, I'll give an example, for instance. So in the, in the cashew business, we decided, one of the things we decided was, I said, we want to create a product that can go on any shelf in the world because we're trying to take the product to create, you know, high quality cashew snack. That's what we're, that's the, that's the ambition. And so the first difficult decision we had to take was, well, if you are going to be a high quality cashew brand that wants to go on, you know, the shelves in supermarkets in Europe or wherever it is, you cannot be in the bottle in Nigeria, right? And that, that was a, a little bit of a painful decision because if you're familiar with, you know, the granite and all those things, most of them come in the bottle, the bottle uh, channel, uh, distribution channel is probably a lot more lucrative than a lot of other channels, but there was no way I can say to someone that, oh yeah, look, our cashew is high quality, it's well produced and everything. And then we show them that it's coming in bottles that you know, are often not sterilized. People are using hands to fill the bottle, all of that stuff. You can't, so you can't, if you decide you're going left, you can't be doing things that are supposed to be happening on the right. And so it becomes, you know, a, a specific business decision that you have to make. So if you're wanting to build a brand, you've got to be very specific in the things you do. And because you've picked a position, you put a peg in the ground, there's certain things you can no longer do. And, but if you start taking short-term short decisions and doing those things, you get into a lot of problems, you know, because then, like, you can't tell one person, oh, we're high quality, and they say, ah, but I saw, I saw your, your product in the bottle in Lagos, those, those uh, you know, uh, old-looking, raggedy bottles, you, your product was there, and then you start, you know, making expansions, oh, we have another place where we produce that, nobody believes that, because... The moment they associate your brand with that, they will not believe the high value stuff. So they go and be buying the low quality stuff. At the same time, you can decide, well, look, I want, we want to create a product for everybody. We want to create a mass market product, which is all about, you know, the price. We don't care about the quality. We don't care about that stuff. Then if you don't do that, I had a client who came to me like this. They had a product like that. And it was like, oh, look, can you advise me on how to create the kind of packaging you have? And the question I asked was, Will your customers pay for that package? Will they pay you extra for because it will cost you a bit more to to get the packaging? It will cost you a bit more to have the machines to uh, to fill those packages, seal it, make it look nice and stuff. Will the consumers that you are targeting will they pay that extra? Obviously, the answer was no. Uh, and so, I mean, save them a lot of money just by spending a bit more time getting very clear. So the first thing I will tell you is that clarity is the, it's for me before anything I do, I say it's better if you have, if you have a hundred percent of the time, if you spend 50% of the time getting clear before you even make a move, I think you'll be better off for it. The second thing then is, you know, so there's clarity. The second word I want to say to you is positioning. Now, the, the positioning is a lot. There's so much in that space. But the first thing I would say is that what channels are you present, right? So if you take, you know, a product, if you if you're targeting, if you say we're a premium product, would we find you in the premium channels? You know, would you? Would you be in those channels? Would you, so let's say, for instance, I'm selling, you know, though it's a little bit in Nigeria, it's a little bit, it's, it's not exactly 100% because I see products in channels that shouldn't be there, but that's a function of some of sometimes uh, the supermarkets or whoever is trying to, just trying to maximize their, their income. But if you said, let, let me use the example of South Africa. So South Africa has got uh, four big supermarket brands. So there's Woolworths, there's Speak and Pay, uh, there's, um, what is it? There's Speak and Pay, there's uh, the ShopRite. I can't remember the fourth one. Now, Woolworths is the, is the premium of the supermarket. That's where, you know, all the, you know, like, I guess you would call them wealthy people or well-to-do people go and go and shop. If you walk into Woolworths, first of all, a lot of things there are Woolworths brands and then maybe some expensive brands, but everything about Woolworths speaks expensive. You know, the way the layout looks, the way they treat you, everything speaks expensive. And that's where people go who, you know, 
I don't know what, who think, you know, I want premium products. Then if you go to, you know, short price, short, short price checkers, or even, I think we can pay is like middle of the road, but short price is the low end, it's everyday low prices. And so the products you find in there, the way the things are there, it's, you can see it's different, right? And so if you want to, you know, be positioned or if you want to be uh, perceived as a premium brand, you got to be showing up in Woolworths, not in ShopRite checkers, right? And if it's vice versa, you got to be showing up in checkers, not Woolworths. Though if you're a low quality product, Woolworths won't even take you. So, you know, even if you insist you wanted to show up there, that's one. The second thing about it is that the kind of communication that you put out and the kind of places where you're found, it's got to match the people that you are uh, targeting, you know, the, uh, so if I if we say let me see, so let's say um, I'm looking for a, a really like a good example. So let's say I want to be you know a a thought leader on um, on any specific topic, right? Like maybe let's say fashion. It will be important for me to be found in things like Vogue, Cosmo. I don't know you know all the top fashion magazines being there and showing up consistently because what would happen is people who understand that space who are looking for you know uh, let's say top brand or whatever it is that's where they go first right and if they don't find you there there's usually going to be a question mark like why are you not there is it because your work is not good is it so so you can kind of see why it's important for you to show up in the right channels because your absence is not you know so let's so give me for example for a long time ah i don't like writing i i, I don't even like putting out videos all that stuff now when someone goes to look for my work doesn't see the video doesn't see me on the video doesn't see anything i've written they don't say oh maybe he doesn't like doing that kind of thing that's not what they say they just say well i mean if it's not there it's not here maybe it's not Maybe it's not that good. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it's not. Uh, it's not what we're looking for. And that's why usually, you know, folks tell you, "Oh, you got to put content out. You got to do this. You got to do that." But I would specifically, it's not that you've got to do it. You've got to be deliberate about doing it, and doing it in a way that communicates exactly uh, to the people who are your core audience. These are the people. Who, this is the problems that you're solving. Now, will will the information pick up a lot of other people? Yes, it will, but it is easy or it is easiest to speak to specifics than to speak generally, because when you're speaking generally, uh, you don't, you say a lot, you speak a lot, but you don't really say a lot. But if you're speaking specifically, you say a lot to the point that people on the periphery were like, oh, you know, this person is really good. Maybe uh, they could help me on this because they understand the topic. Maybe they could help me in my in my own industry. But when you speak generally, you sound you know you almost sound like a uh, what I call them like a you know motivational speaker who's not they've not got any anything behind it. They've got the general things so work hard, do this and stuff. Like for instance, what does work hard mean in my own industry? You know, so 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 that positioning is very important. Be products if you're doing products or you're doing services. You've got to be in the right channels and people have got to know who you are so you've got to invest in building that brand the final one is um is action um so all, the thing about action is this if you've done all of the things i've said without action you haven't really done anything right because it's when you start to act that things start to happen. You start to see results, you start to get feedback, you, or, and all of this inform what you need to do next, right? But if you don't, I think it was, uh, uh, I, I don't know, I think it was Mike Tyson that everyone's got a good plan until they punched, they're punched in the face, right? And so I always say it's very important to plan, to plan, you know, think about the risk, all of that good stuff, but you must then act. Now, you must act with intent. Oftentimes people, you know, so you we write a, we do a business plan and you know, you can put in the chat if you fall into this category, you do a business plan, you have an actual plan, which says that we're gonna call, you know, when you're gonna call 20 people, you know, 
every week for the next three months, um, every day for the next three months. Let's say five days a week. So that's 100 calls, 100 calls a month, um, 100 calls a week. If you multiply by 12, that's 12, uh, that's what, well, yeah, about 1,200 calls. Now, most people, most businesses I've come across never do that. They'll have one day where they do 20, they'll have one day where they do 10, they'll have one day where they do nothing, they, and they'll go through, and then they'll get to the end of the period, and they probably don't get the result they're looking for, and they use words like, oh, the plan didn't work. The question I have for you is, is it that the plan didn't work, or they didn't work the plan? And the problem with not working the plan, you know, is that you are not able to, you know, in you know i guess what i call you're not able to iterate around that plan because you didn't do what you said you were supposed to do so we don't know if that plan would have worked because you didn't really implement the plan so i always say that action for me has got two things you've got to do around action two things the first one is you must you know measure the action itself the execution of the action. So I always say to my clients, listen, if we set out a plan, we need to be scoring anything between 95 to 99% on execution. This is not whether the plan is working. So forget about that for a second. There are two parts to action. The first one is if we say we're going to make 1,200 calls of which 20 will be made daily, you know, every five days for 90 days, we must try as much as possible to do exactly that. And we must call whether we're doing that. Because that's the first step. The first step is to make sure that your action is work. Action, the action part of it is working. In the sense that we're making those calls. The second part of action is the effectiveness of the action you're taking. And this is, you know, so we're supposed to make 20 calls. Of these 20 calls, we're supposed to speak to our prospectives. And they are supposed to, maybe we're supposed to either convert them into pipeline or convert them into sales. We have a sales script that we're using. Now, at the end of every day, every person who's making a call should, you know, tell us, okay, so maybe I was allocated 10 calls. I made 10 calls. This is what happened. This was the context. And this is what happened. So every day we're reporting what we're getting. And then what I usually say is that at the end of the week, do an after action review, which is we look at the action and we say, are we getting the results that we want? What is the problem? Is it that the script, which script is working? Should we change it? And so at the, at the end of that conversation, you should be able to answer questions like what's working, what's not working? What are you going to start doing? What will you stop and what will you continue? So basically, what you're not doing is you're combining effect, uh, uh, consistency of action with effectiveness of action. And that, those two together will drive, I don't, it doesn't even matter if it's small actions, those will drive you further in business than big gestures that happen occasionally, you know, like, oh, we just, uh, like we do in, a, what do you call it, in uh, in retail, we go to OKR with a boss, paint the boss with musicians, we say we are doing activation, we make a lot of noise for two, three days, sales goes up for those three, three days, then we go back to, you know, to the company, then you're not, you, you know, you're not visiting your retail locations, you're not calling your merchandisers, you know, doing all of those things you need to be doing on a daily basis to drive sales. Obviously, it won't work. And then we sit down and say, oh, the activation won't work. But it's not true. The activation did work. You are the one that is not working. You know, so, I mean, so for me, that action bit is, is very, very important. So just to kind of recap, you know, we started with clarity, positioning, and then action. And you, if you already have a business, you can use this as a framework to, to evaluate your business, which is how we do on clarity, how we do on positioning, and how we do on action. And you can use that and you can do two things. One column is your current state, which is, you know, three, on the three things, what's my current state? And then on the other side of it is, what's our future state? What, what are we moving to? Then you use some of the things I've said here today to create, to create an action plan. Here's the thing about creating an action plan. Please, you know, don't, there's no self-deception is the worst kind of thing you could do to yourself. If you can only make five calls, okay, commit to making the five calls and that's it. Don't write, oh, we'll make 15 calls, dominate the world. That's, you know, it, that you're just setting yourself off in a mind where 
every day you're making yourself wrong okay now i'm not saying you shouldn't you know aspire to make 15 calls i'm saying when you're setting these plans decide what you commit to what you're going to do are you because if you if you currently make two calls and they say oh every day we're going to make 15 it may be realistic it may be self-deception i don't know it depends on what you commit to and you do because it once you figure out, okay, look, this is what I'm going to commit to. I'm going to unleash the power of, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it? Love compounding. I'm going to unleash it in my business and I'm going to consistently do this. Then you have a winner because simply the, 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 the universe and the environment responds to consistency. It, it does. It's not, it's not magic. It just responds. And I can assure you that a, an average product that is consistently marketed and did the right things done will beat a great product where people show up once in a while to, uh, to I guess, what's the word, to push it. So in closing, get very clear, position yourself properly and act. Thank you. Wow, 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 wow. Our time is fast spent. It's it's amazing. Like I was just writing and writing. One of the things you said that really struck me, and I'm going to go and digest it is if you're serving everybody, you are serving nobody. And I'm sure you know you were trying to explain a point, but the way I got it was, and I typed it in the chat room is you can't be in a bottle in Nigeria and expect to be in a shelf in the UK. Like, what's your package? That was that was heavy for me. So it's not like the content is not right, but what you pack the content with is going to limit your movement. I have it underlined. You can have the right content, but the wrong package. And that wrong package is going to limit your movements. It, it's, it's been awesome. Offense, are you there? Okay, so now it's round table. We are having time for questions <laughs> all these yoruba people in the house is it because we brought oluwa davilare oluwa davilare you caused chaos so everybody's not typing yoruba for us in the chat room <laughs> so please can we have questions offense oh, we are supposed to be doing this together while we are doing this we'll be dropping our feedback form please ensure you feel it well we are taking the questions. Can we have the questions in the chat room? So, um, while the, um, Mrs. Damilari was speaking, something that jumped at me, and I think this cuts across everybody, is some of the problems that would take you to die your next level, you've turned it to gossip point. Because in my head, what a typical housewife will do is, hey, please, permit me to be dramatic. People that know me know that I can be quite dramatic and I'm a Yoruba woman like, ah, yakweju, hey, oh, I won't come. Okay, I have the global audience, so let me speak English. Yakweju, come and see one that will never end. We've said the children of nowadays, the way we are raising our children, in fact, I'm sorry for the next generation. Can you believe that a Yoruba child in Nigeria, and not even, you know, you turn what your brain should use to produce money, help your next generation, is got it point, Telemundo, be apologies. And I hope that with all these very practical examples that we've received today, you're going back to understand that the problems you have, they are actually not problems, they are opportunities for your next level if you can approach it right, if you can think right, that that person asking you that question, that person reaching out to you is actually helping you to bring out what you have in you. We had Dr. Ebi and Dr. Ebi, that's, that struck me because it's true. You can't joke with data. I do data in my other life, as I like to say, and I will tell you whatever decision you want me to take, please give me the data. Your data is very correct. How many people above 40 can boast of two parents? That's the truth. So that's that's like, I'm like, wow. And truly, 
what's the point of giving a solution that nobody's going to buy? Does it make sense? So please, can we, let me see, do we have any questions? So question, I let, let me start with my question, and this is going to Mr. Ayodele. Mr. Ayodele, why cash you not? Out of all the things in Nigeria, you know, you've spoken about clarity, picking this and all of that. Why cash you not? I've always, I, and, and thank you, as I said, this is dream come true for me. So when I was first listening to you, like, cashew not why cashew not that was what popped in my head when i was listening to your interview so i have yeah, the opportunity to ask that question next to that question but by, by the way i'm uh, you know i've exited that business but my partners still remain uh i mean why did we do cashews i mean for it was purely accidental you know, because we we had set off trying to um so the backstory is I was in South Africa with, with two of my, with one of the partners in the business, and we was doing the financial crisis in in the global financial crisis. One of the things that we saw in South Africa was that it was South Africa was impacted, but nowhere near the rest of Africa. And the one thing that was uh, that was happening in South Africa is that South Africa produces everything that it consumes. It's only a handful of things that they import, and when you look at what's on the import list, they are all uh, they are all, I guess you could call them lux luxuries, but, you know, because uh, even oil, they convert, they've got technology where they convert coal to, to crude oil. So, so, so we thought, okay, look, if you look at Nigeria, it's the other way around where we import a lot of stuff because the things we consume, we don't produce enough of them domestically. And so we thought, okay, look, yeah, let's, maybe we could go and grow something. And we, they, we, we started looking into land. Uh, we started having conversations. And by the time we did the initial analysis, you would have only 2000 hectares of land. I think the, the numbers we got were like, to get it to a point where you could grow something on it, you will have spent over a million dollars. And, and, and Nigeria doesn't allow you to capitalize you know, expenses for land preparation. So that means that there's no value going on your balance sheet. It means that all of that 1 million is expenses, just OPEX, that's it. And so, so we thought, okay, well, if we get our hands on a million dollars, it would be crazy to use it to clear land and get no benefit for it. Because even the investors that give you that kind of money are looking at your balance sheet and there's nothing there. So we thought, okay, look, let's, move one step up the chain, which is let's add, find a product that we can add value to, and then maybe we'll come back to the farm. Now, Cashew itself, while we're doing the land investigation, one of one other party joined us and their family had, you know, they had an, an abandoned Cashew, uh, Cashew factory, which was defunct. And then we, we spent about a year and a half doing no, no, just about a year doing, you know, investigations on cashew conferences, going to Vietnam, checking machines and all of that stuff and decided, okay, look, this is something we could go into. And the main thesis was because today cashew is produced, I think it's about 55% across West Africa. Most of that cashews or the cashews is then loaded off into ships going into Asia, mostly Vietnam and a bit of India for processing. Then the cashew then leaves Vietnam to come back. So it goes, so if you track the journey, it leaves the Atlantic Ocean to go into the Indian Ocean for processing. Then when it's processed, it then leaves the Indian Ocean to go back into the Atlantic Ocean, which is the US and the EU for final finishing into snacks that can be, uh, that, that you see in supermarkets. The question then is, why do the producers who are all sitting in India, in the Atlantic Ocean, not processing it and sending it across to their, you know, to the other parties who are also, you know, in the Atlantic Ocean. There are many, I mean, you can get me talking on cashews for, for days. You know, there are all structural issues that exist in West Africa that make it difficult. But that was the reason why we thought we could do it successfully. And I mean, you know, we had some success, but very challenging space to, uh, to operate. But yeah, but that's, that's how we ended up in cashews. So uh, when we started the journey, didn't didn't know it didn't know a thing about cashews, but I've ended up knowing I guess maybe more than I want to know. But one of the things I I like I hold one of the fond memories I hold from the cashew space is the cashew space has, has allowed me to 
function you know from the farm all the way to to the boardrooms you know where of big companies so during my time there you could it wasn't unusual to see me sitting under a, a tree with a village chief discussing how we'll get cashews from their uh, from their location you know and uh and and damn larry we always kind of spoke here about that so well, yeah, i'm a Yoruba person then going to you know dealing with the likes of olam or some of the big players in um what do you call them the guys who make peanuts um, uh I can't, I can't remember their name now uh who you know they're now big factories where you have, you know you've got to put on your suits and tie and you know use powerpoints and the like and stuff so you know, so I learned quite a bit in, in that space and uh, and I continue to enjoy playing in the agri space. Wow, amazing, amazing, amazing. Guys, I hope you're taking notes. One of the things that jumped out at me is, it was like when he started, he didn't know a thing about cashew. Right now, he can lecture you for days on cashews. And one challenge I want to put out to Ross, because that is something I personally see in a number of our businesses, we are not deep. We're just on the surface. You don't do research. Did you hear all of those? Permit me to be a little bit. Uh, like, did you hear all of those big, big grammar? As in, uh, when you hear that grammar, can't you go hungry you now? Like, you know, when we go on the Indian Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, this is what I'm talking about. Thank you so very much, sir. The next question is um, going to. Mrs. Damilari Akonilede Yoruba. <laughs> At the point, and thank you so much for that point you dropped on service. That was amazing. And I hope somebody caught that. For one and a half years, that's a symposium topic. Of course, you guys can see we are just scratching the surface. You, you heard all the speakers starting from Ezekiel say, I do 10 hours on this thing. So this is just like opening up our minds to possibilities and to help us understand, as we always say that great men are not born great. Greatness is a process and you can hear their stories. One of the things she said, I, I wrote it down again, one and a half years she was doing it and she was sacrificing her soup money. That part I don't understand. My, okay, you are covering face. How, how were people eating in the house? All these women eat well. Okay, so it said, Ma, at the point you began to gain global attention, how did you undo the new reality? From wow. an obscure housewife to somebody that had the liver. Hey, to be charging 500K to learn your river. Okay. Please, the, the little part of the question, can you rephrase it so that I will answer it correctly? Please, Ma, at the point you began to gain global attention, how did you undo the new reality? Thank you. Um, this question, I get it a lot, probably not in this format, but something like this. So um, the first, um, 2019, I was teaching and all and all, and then 2020 came, February, and then there was this uh, pandemic. Is it pandemic? So I was teaching a parent, their children. I would go to their house somewhere in this um, Lagos, Magodo. So she called me. She said that, um, Dam Larry, please, you can't come to our house for now. Can you come? Can you come? I'm like, Ma, I did not have COVID. I will not bring COVID to the children. I was afraid. And I said to myself, this cannot be the end of this Yoruba brand. Like I was, I was furious. I was angry. There's this only anger. Like, because if I stop, that's the end. Because she paid me, I think she paid 35,000, 2020, around here. And I, I was ready for the next thing. And then I said, husband, please, how can I start teaching your language? Husband doesn't have an idea. And then I spoke to my coach, Coach Aladdin Shaka, I asked her, Sir, Ma, I know you have coaching calls with people that are not in Nigeria. You see, your association, just make people that have brain, people that are at that level. If not, your life will just, I, I'm sorry, let me move on. I said, coach, what do you, do you use? And she said she uses Zoom. I said, Zoom, oh, you Zoom, where are thou? I checked my laptop. I have a very small laptop that can't handle Zoom. And then I called a brother, my brother, he is into photography. And then I said, um, do you have a laptop? I know you said no. So a friend had, please hold this tight. A friend heard my conversation with my husband in the car. I was going to the hospital that day. 
And then she said, ah, Mrs. Amai, do you need a laptop? I have one. They're going to give another one for free in the office to work from home that she will give me that laptop. And then she lent me that laptop for three months. I did not pay one error. And parents started coming in, coming in. Once I realized that, oh, more, I cannot handle this. If I had a French challenge and there is about 50 students, can you teach everybody at the same time? Then I look up, I look down. I am just thin. I'm like, this me, you could see the cocoon. This is all of me. I am not as big as Mrs. Sitsunu that, okay, I will do it. And then I said, no. Bible said, uh, wisdom is profitable to direct. I said, no, I need more people. So that was how I opened up the opportunity for Yoruba language teachers, come and see people. But they don't have the capacity. They were not prepared for the, you know, this new whatever it is. They are not technology driven. They are not creative. It's just the classroom. Ah, I'm a kawale. Ah, we are teaching. Ah, that's not the way. Now we have changed the narrative. We did. I am part of people that changed how this thing is being taught online, right? So, I recruited more people, more teachers. I recruited another staff to handle the customer. I was not even collecting salary. I was using my own salary to pay them because I was not so sure. It's like doing it afraid. I was not so sure if this will continue even after COVID. But trust me, there's all the energy in me. I said, COVID or no COVID, this is a brand that has come to stay and is going global. So having people work with me, remember I said, you, have to, you need a team. So even if you start with your husband or your child, make sure you're a team and you're doing it professionally, not our, our, not a, this is not my husband, this is not my brother. How? You won't grow. Do it, have your papers right, have your um, processes right. For the point, my brother was misbehaving, I sack him, Malo. Go, you cannot take it, you can't take it where I'm going. So even some of the teachers too, like, you know, I, I dropped one later. She was not seeing the big vision ahead. I dropped, I let her go. So don't hold people that you must work with me. It's not compulsory. They are, God did not send them to you. Look for somebody that God has sent to you. So that was how I to handle that global thing. Then, yeah. I hope I, I have answered the question. Yeah, amazing. I'm looking at the time and questions are coming in. This other question is for you also. So before you go. The truth is, for everybody on this call, we are hearing all these big, big things. It gets to a stage where we all get tired. So this was directly to you. It says, when you felt like quitting, Ma, how did you handle it? Okay, so um, please, this is actually being streamed on Facebook. We have a community of over 2,000 on wow. Facebook, so we are wow. not just here. So this is from one of the people on the Facebook community. That so when you felt I, like quitting, how did you handle it? I handled it with feedback, feedback from parents. I will, after each level, I'll ask mom, please mom, just share your feedback. What improvement have, have you seen? What do you want me to do better? And I'll go back to all those feedback and I'll read them. Trust me, by this energy I derive from here. No, I can't stop. So if I have just 200 students now, there are 200,000 students. In fact, there, I usually bold, I will say body that I want to teach Obama Yoruba. If I can see him on this call, I will teach him. So that energy always comes. Something must be driving you, plus the community I have, the chairs me up. Anytime they see my post, anywhere, anything, I'm like, well done. And me, I am tired. I am feeling that weakness because I cannot do it alone. At, the, at a point in your life, you realize that you are tired, you are frustrated, you are, you are not even being motivated. The money is not there. Like I said, the money was not there. It's not the money for me. Now, if I'm charging half a million, one million, please don't envy me. I have so far on this thing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Your, your passion is amazing. Your passion is truly, truly amazing. Dr. Ebi, this one is symposium talk, but please help us. Please share basic tips on getting started after discovering this hungry market you spoke about that needs one solution. Basic tips on how to start. Special tips. They want basic. They want special tips on how to start. Thank okay. you, sir. So, yeah. So, you've identified the market now. There is something in tech we call the minimum viable products. That's the minimum form of your service that costs the least amount of money that you can need to test the markets. So, they said it with their mouth. They have a problem. You have to give them something to buy and see if they actually buy it. So I'll use Gerald here as an example. When we had the idea 
or creating a platform whereby people could sign up for their parents and could send doctors to them, what we first of all did was use free Google Forms. So people could request for the care with Google Forms. The doctors put in their reports with Google Forms and we sent it to the users. So everything we did didn't cost us one naira at all. The thing is, at that point in time, if they actually use you, then you will know it's a service they will actually pay for. Because many times what people say and what they do are two different things. Like the example I gave of the first business, everybody said, wonderful idea, great idea. But then I launched it and nobody bought. I had already spent money on it. So now you have identified the market. You have to find the crudest possible way of trying to put that solution out to determine if people will actually buy that solution before you spend more money on it. Right now, we're still growing based on feedback. So we don't add everything. It's what they ask for, we add to the product. So you found the market now. You create the cheapest form of your product and see if they actually use it. If they don't use that one, no matter how much you spend on creating the big one, they won't buy that one also. So the first step is to create a minimum viable product and put it out to the market and see if those people actually are willing to pay you money for it. If they're not willing to pay at that time, you can also start by getting what they call pre-orders. Try and find enough people to order for the product. So you can have a pre-order, a waiting list of people that have indicated clear interest that they will purchase the service when it comes. So the first level was asking them questions, finding out if they have the problem. The second level is finding out if they will actually give you money for that problem. So if they have a waiting list or they pre-order, you can be sure, okay, if I spend more money, I will get my money back. If you don't have a waiting list, you can create a minimum viable product, spend the least amount of money, find the crudest form of your product, and then sell it to them. I remember the story of, um, I don't know how true it is, of Tesla when it was creating sport vehicles that are electric vehicles. What it did was found a normal vehicle, remove the engine, replace it with an electric one, and then see if anybody were interested in buying that vehicle. He didn't go and create an electric vehicle that was you know, sports looking and stuff like that. He found a way to use a minimum viable product to test the market. So the first thing you should do is test the market to the crudest form of your solution and see if anybody actually pays for it. Wow, this is, if it was um, church, I would have said offering time. This one, mm. if we should drop offering, like this is amazing. What people say and what people do are very different. So true. So true. Thank you very much, sir. While we take the last question, please, all our speakers, I don't know if you can drop your most active social media platform so that the people can follow you, follow you and um, reach out to you after this. Now. The last question is going to Mr. Ayodele. What can you say is the future skill set for building a strong business? <clears throat> so, sorry, repeat the question. What can I say is the future skill set? Future skill set required for building a strong business. Interesting question. I think, um, you know, the, so in my view, the leadership is probably uh, one of the most important things in getting a business to be very successful. And so when I look at the business, it's almost all about the psychology of the leader of that business. What's your mindset, what you're driving. So, so that leadership part of things, I think is crucial. And if you look at all around you at the moment, uh, in most countries, leadership is missing because a lot of what's going on most places is everybody's telling us how bad things are how you know it's going to be tough it, and the question i always ask is so how does this how does this help anybody so we, you've told me the first time it's going to be tough the next thing i want to hear is okay so what can we do to move forward so i think leadership if you combine you know leadership with the habit of getting very clear on what you're trying to do so the clarity and mix massive action into the mix there i think you have some somewhat of a of a winning formula and the other thing about leadership is that leadership allows you first of all to you know have the sense to build the right team and then you know lead your team to uh to deploy what i call discretionary energy so where people are doing more than you're paying them for uh because simply because they are i, I guess the word is they are attracted to whatever it is, whatever mission or vision you guys are on, 
So being very clear on that purpose, providing people with leadership, uh, and then driving real action, uh, I think are things that uh, that most businesses will need going into 2023. So if you haven't done it already, if you have a business, you should ask yourself, what is one thing that we need to do in to set ourselves up for you know success in 2023 so how are we going to become more productive so so spend the next couple of weeks you know reflecting on what you've done this year then what are you going to do in in 2023 don't pick more than three if it's more than three then that you're just you're just listing stuff maybe three things and then Try and spend some time to define your first 90 days of, of 2023 in terms of actually try and map it out on a weekly basis. What are you going to do? And then apply some of the things I said earlier on, you know, when I was speaking, which is around if you know exactly what you're going to do for the first three months and then you start operating on a weekly basis, making sure you do what you said you would do, reflecting whether it works and then maybe tweak it a bit, then go again the following week and continue that way. Uh, for the first 90 days, you'll be shocked at what you get done in, in 2023. When you're getting close to the end of that 90 days, create a plan for the next 90 days and then do it again and run your, you know, run. so basically I'm saying that have four years in 2023, each year is made up of 90 days and, and run, you know, run, you know, uh, with intent, take massive action. If you can be productive be very productive because when you go into a recession those who will survive are those who are productive if you're not productive i.e so if you are able to produce two a week this year maybe next year you should be looking for ways to produce six using the same thing right so using the same resources because if you increase your resources and your your output increases it may not necessarily that you be that you're productive it might just be that you have more resources okay so the same resources, more output. If you add additional resources to what you have, what is the uh, what is the stretch output that you should get? And that way, you put yourself and your business in a position to succeed in a year that everybody is going to be crying about, you know, cost of living crisis, uh, recession, and all of those things. All of those things are going to happen. There's nothing you can do about it. But remember that those things are. Uh, what do you call it? It's the sum of everything. It's the, it's the sum of everything that happens. It means that some people will go up, some people will go down. Why is a recession is that the number of people that go down is a lot more than the number of people that go up, right? That's my crude way of explaining it. Make sure you're in the, you know, in the category of those who go up. Because the people who go up and the people who go down is not ordained anywhere, is not prescribed anywhere. You decide which category you're going to be in. And if you spend your time on, I don't know, CNN, Sky News, all of those things, you'll probably be in the category that uh, yeah, that is going down. But if you spend all your time figuring out how can I be more productive in 2023, you will surprise yourself. In fact, like that was that was that was amazing. Please, I hope we all caught that. Recession is inevitable. Your side of the divide is 100% your choice. Please, the feedback form is in there. This is a well-spent time. You, you can't be listening to things like this and you'd be afraid of recession. How now? How? So as we round up and I hand over to offense, I'd like to have just one last word from all the speakers and over to you, Ofems. It's been amazing, amazing, amazing evening for me. One last word, let's start from the ladies. They say ladies first. I would say do the work. Even if you have, if you have to do it afraid, do the work. No work, no results. Dr. Ebi. Okay. So for me, I'll piggyback on a question that was asked to um, Oluda Milari as to what kept her going. So for me, when you start a business, I think the why, the reason why you start should be strong, such that in the times when, when it feels like a downtime, you are still willing to continue. So for us at Gerald Care, as I said, it's because of my father's ill health I started. And so no matter what's going on, each time I get home, I realize why I'm doing this. And that if I stop, a lot of people will experience what I'm experiencing. 
So my why is extremely strong. Again, similar to what Odam Larry said, for the there will be periods whereby you are tired, you are you know stressed, you don't want to continue, but you know why you started, and that why should be strong enough to keep you going. Ayodele, the last word from you, please. Yeah, I would just say, you know, do do our things and be more productive in 2023. <laughs> well, that is hard. Do hard things. <laughs> do hard things. Okay, thank you so very much. Sir. Over to you, Offense. Wow. It's been it's been like um an exposition of a lot of things put together and we just can't um, finish exhausting and comprehending everything that has been said here. And from every one member of the Reed cohort, Sue family, and also from all over the world and um, in Africa and all that, we really want to appreciate your time. I want to say all of, all you have said, all you have given to us, um, we'll get the, 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 the success stories from the people that attended. And of course, we're gonna be putting some graphical works out there and also um, um, make sure that we tag you people when it comes to all of these things, because it has a way of also telling you how impactful your words have been. And we want to really appreciate you for sharing your personal stories, for sharing your growth processes, and then also teaching us the strategies on how you got there. You know, these are not just rocket science. These are the things that you have applied and then we've seen them work in your life. Sincerely, from every one of us at the Read NGR platform, we do want to appreciate you and thank you so, so much for your time. And I believe Coach will get to you um, after this. And Coach, to your amazing personality to every one of us in this platform, thank you so much for bringing such an amazing speaker. Imagine what we would have paid to these amazing persons to bring them on a platform like this. How would we have offered it? As in how, how? <laughs> thank you so much, ma. It's always yeah, thank a big you. thing. It's always a big thing to, you know, having you to see you connect us with such global entities and people with the phenomenal experiences all over the world. Thank you so, so much, ma. We are so grateful. So um, I think that will be all for now. And I want to say thank you everyone, to everyone working at the back end to ensure all our ICT services are connected and all of that. Kudos to everyone. Thank you so very much. So this is a good Please guys unmute our mics and say thank you to all the right, speakers. All right, everybody unmute your mic and say thank you to our speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.